Okay, so InnoPharma itself was founded in 2009. There are three divisions, one of which you'll be familiar with, the education side uh, is also involved in upskilling. Uh, the technology division, we're here to enable advanced manufacturing using process analytical technology, and I'll give you some of the history there. Uh, but we have a third division, technical services, and I understand that some of you are even, have even um, come from there. So currently we have about 70 employees experienced in STEM fields, in pharma development, in manufacturing operations and soft, software development. And yeah, so like I said, we're based here in, uh, in Sandyford. And under normal circumstances, of course, you'd be in the lab with us for a demonstration like this. Hopefully, we'll be able to see you by the end of the by the end of your course. So, just to talk a little bit about just to talk a little bit about the um, PAT, our journey so far toward advanced manufacturing platforms. We started, as I said, in two thousand and nine, uh, develop, developing sensors for focused on solids processing. So, the Icon Analyzer is a, is a re inline real time image uh, image analysis tool that can be used for particle size detection. Uh, we have a second generation of that device. We also have a near-infrared device we'll discuss briefly today as well. Uh, in fact, we'll discuss the second generation of that too. We've been moving in the past few years, like everyone else, toward advanced manufacturing. So not just using the sensors and uh, simple control mechanisms, but higher level control and automation. Um, where we can use prediction and advanced analytics to tell us deeper information about our processes. And we're focused on the development of uh, SmartX for fluid bed granulation and coating. That was how we started off for crystallization and now more recently for twin screw granulation. Okay, so there are some things that we've been working on that are of relevance to all of you, uh, particularly around our research and development of industrial Internet of Things platforms. Um, for development and manufacturing. Yes, so I see PSD and N NIR. P PSD is particle size determination and NIR is near infrared. So near infrared spectroscopy, it's one of the methods of spectroscopy that we'll use in the, in the lab. Uh, and we'll look at that uh, later on today. There'll, there will be a lot of uh, acronyms and abbreviations. Please do ask uh, if there's anything that I don't cover. Okay. So industry 4.0, advanced manufacturing, smart factories, these are all buzzwords. Um, and some of the buzz around it describes industry 4.0 as a, a, a revolution. Uh, in some respects, though, it is just an evolution from industry 1.0, <laughs> the first industrial revolution, which involved mechanization, steam and water power. The second industrial revolution involved mass production and electricity. The third, electronic electronics and IT systems and automation. The fourth is being described as cyber physical systems. And most recently, people have started to discuss even industry 5.0, in which we see how they, these cyber physical systems interact with the uh, environment. So there are questions of uh, sustainability that have to be considered, and also the Im impact on people and culture and, uh, and skills. So there is a fifth industrial revolution at least being talked about at the, at the moment. So you've, you're, you've taken this course at a very timely time. There is a regulatory perspective here as well. Uh, there's there's a, a good reason to start looking at digital transformation and advanced manufacturing, uh, not least because it is being supported by the various uh, food and drug administrations, by the European Med Medicines Agency and so on. They're really trying to push industry to uh, to include digital record keeping, and they're they're insisting that with standards and regulations, these these things have to be controlled and monitored. Uh, and they're doing this by encouraging us with respect to the the uh, how how easy it makes manufacturing. At least that's what they claim. So. Um, Questions. I want you to spam the chat box now with some answers to these. What kinds of technology facilitate regulation in manufacturing? I just made the claim that the regulators want us 
to employ uh, to employ technology, process analytical technology, to uh, aid in the regulation of manufacturing. What kinds of technology help would help us to do that? Um, what standards or regulation regulations do you feel make it easier to comply uh, with regulations due to technology? Um, or what? Sorry, what? Technologies make it easier to, to, to comply with standards and regulations, or what standards and regulations are easier to comply with due to technology. Computer vision, I see, is one. Yeah, certainly. And in fact, um, our particle size analyzer uses Im uh, automated image analysis. Um, so related, deep learning, yes. Uh, so certainly artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, yep, all of these things. And so I want you to think about today paperless records, APIs, sensors, yes, data integrity, absolutely. Yeah, so, so audit trails, yes. So here we go, even these are exactly the right points. And these are in fact the ar arguments that the regulators are putting forward. It doesn't just mean that they have greater insight into our business. It, it means that we have greater in in insights into our own processes. Okay, what standards are only possible to comply with due to technology? You may have already given uh, shared control, excellent as well. So sharing uh, control across different sites, um, technology transfer, etc. Complete batch life cycle, yeah, exactly. Okay, so we understand, uh, <laughs> this is great. Uh, I'm, I'm delighted now you have actually engaged on this and you have uh, literally started spamming the the, the chat box, but I'm going to have to turn away from that so I can um, concentrate on, on the rest of the presentation uh, because I do want to get to the tour as well. So some of the issues around uh, advanced manufacturing, these things put forward by the regulator demonstrate and our own experience uh, in manufacturing shows us that we need, uh, that the need exists for more consistent, reproducible and compliant executions of designs of experiments. Uh, so where we explore the phase space of process parameters and so on. We'll see more of that later on. Advanced manufacturing lends itself to addressing this need by providing workflows to facil facilitate this. Digitized quality by design approaches uh, through, automated, through automated design of, execu uh, design of experiment execution. But also, as you've pointed out, the automated collation, contextualization, visualization, and sharing of PAT and process data, so that's process analytical technology and process data, and bridging the gap between process engineering and automation engineering. So this enables faster process development. This means we can respond in real time, finding out how our process is doing, respond in real time to make changes in real time and that way accelerate accelerate process development and also as mentioned uh, tech transfer and of course this enables manufacturers to take a more industry 4.0 approach to quality by design and design of design of experiments okay oh, okay the jumping on a little bit too far there um, so you've seen the automation pyramid and what we're going to talk about today are essentially levels zero, level one, and level two, because we're talking about sensors and signals from the production process. That's the, that's the, the field, those are the field sensors themselves. At level one, using uh, programmable logic controllers, for example, for the sensing itself and for manipulating the process, for controlling the process parameters. But we'll also talk about how we can get to the next level, the, the, the level of the SCADA and the human. So the level of the, the, the SCADA is the supervisory control and data acquisition, HMI, the human machine interface. And yes, this level is the level of monitoring and super, super, supervision where we can compare, uh, where, where we can compare, yeah, this, this is not our invention, I should point out. This is the ISA 95 automation pyramid, but it's exactly, it's exactly that. The idea is that all of this, all of this data that we're collecting can, can be systematically joined together in a hierarchy 
from the sensor level, from the field level in our factories, right up to enter, en enterprise resource planning. Uh, and today, unfortunately, we're down in the weeds. We're going to talk about the, something that you'll need as digital transformation agents, <laughs> something that you'll need as digital transformation agents, which is an understanding and, and a grasp of how we get from si sensors and signals to the monitoring and supervision level. Okay, so how do we get there? Uh, we get there by recording changes in our process using sensors, converting the sensor data into useful metrics, monitoring our processes in real time, determining ideal trends and limits, and then adjusting process parameters in response to those changes. All right, so before we move on, I want to pause here for a moment and ask if there are uh, any questions. Uh, do you have any questions on what, has, what we've covered so far? We're going to get to more exciting bits in a moment. All right, I see that at least one person is having trouble connecting there. <laughs> no, no thanks with respect to questions. All right, well, perhaps we'll come back to them later on. Uh, th that's better. Okay. okay, so I'll give you a brief introduction into crystallization in pharma. And uh, The purpose here is to give you some background to what you're going to see, the re crystallization reaction that, that we're, going to, we're going to demonstrate later on. And in fact, is already being arranged at the moment. Uh, everything is being set up for us here, so we can go <clears throat> go through this. But I want to show you briefly some of the <clears throat> some of the principles that we'll be covering today uh, in crystallization. So, uh, just to move on with the slides, <coughs> I beg your pardon, um, especially to those present. So, <laughs> so all right, crystallization. Crystallization starts when solute molecules uh, in solution. I need to collapse. I need to collapse my chat box here a little bit so that I can read the content. But yes, uh, solute molecules are present in solution. They cluster together and form little units. Uh, and you can see this happening here in the video, which was a the first direct video observation of nucleation happening. In situ, and it was only achieved this year. It's very difficult to uh, to have microscopy that this fine. The resolution that you're looking at is on the order of uh, just a few atoms, obviously. So this is extremely high resolution microscopy, transmission electron microscopy. Here they've captured video footage of nucleation happening, and you can see crystals forming. These are crystals of uh, salt, NaCl, sodium chloride. Um, so what happens is Clusters develop together, uh, they form a critical size, a critical mass, and so this, once they reach a critical mass, nucleation happens. These clusters start arranging themselves, start arranging themselves into, a, into um, regular arrays, and they prefer to arrange themselves in a in specific way, the, 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 the arrangement of least energy, and uh, from that, they form the first regular crystal, crystalline structures and grow from there. So these smaller units of clusters develop into, nu into crystal nu nuclei, and those nuclei band together uh, to grow in a preferred direction. Now, sometimes the direction is not, it's not preferred, as in there's no energetic... Um, there's no um, energy, energetic advantage to growing a specific direction, so the crystal grows in all directions. Is that like the tempering of chocolates? It's exactly like the tempering of chocolates. And there will be lots of talk uh, of food in this, by the way. Uh, be, not just because we're following a recipe control method, uh, but because many of, the, many of the techniques that we use in, in, in chemistry, and many of the techniques that we use in chemistry, particularly crystal growth, are exactly what we the same techniques as we apply in into um, yeah to, in the kitchen in recipes. Uh, so in fact, a <laughs> question time. There are no right angles in nature, which is common knowledge, even though it's patently false. You work for Cadbury's. I, we'll have to talk after this. Sorry. Um, yeah. 
So examples of crystallization in everyday life. We've already had one. Thank you very much. I think, I believe it was Susan. I, I, I missed the name. I think it was Susan who mentioned it. Uh, chocolate. Uh, was it Stephen? I beg your pardon. Okay. Uh, and uh, yes, I, w I want you to again spam the chat box, which I'll unfortunately have to open the chat box again. And um, yeah, I want you to consider what examples are there of crystallization or crystals in everyday life? And I'm going to give you some prompts here that will appear slowly. So as soon as I give you a prompt, <laughs> I'd like... We already know uh, one at least. Stephen Har Harford works for Cadbury's, yes. Uh, so Stephen has an example from from work. Can you think of examples from home? Soap, very interesting, yes. And ice, excellent. Sugar, ice cubes, yes, excellent. In your food, so we can cover that. In nature, ice cubes, I guess, food and nature. No, and on the island of Ireland. Any takers? Ah, you got it. Nice. Extra points to Armando and in medicines. Does burning food count? <laughs> well, I suppose carbon could form crystals. Anyway, yes, <laughs> you have the idea. Crystals are, in fact, all over what we're using. You're using a crystal right now to uh, view this presentation. Any tablets? Interesting, yes. Uh, uh, tablets, whether in medicine or in electronics. Silicon, uh, silicon chips are an example of an extremely refined crystal. Um, yeah. So what we're going to do is talk about the application specific to pharma. Causeway. Causeway, yes. Sorry, there was a question mark over caseway. Uh, but yes, that we'll we'll see that example in a moment. So there, are, the idea that there are no right angles in nature is patently false. Um, crystalline structures form, and there are they are atomically perfect crystalline structures, except where there are flaws. There are any inclusions anytime something else is included in the crystal structure, it causes the structure the structure to distort from the perfect cubic. There are. Um, there are other examples of crystal shapes, tetragonal, orthorhombic, where one orientation is preferred, one crystal growth direction is preferred over another, monoclinic, where the angles are slightly, um, where angles are slightly distorted, triclinic, where multiple angles are slightly distorted from 90 degrees, and hexagonal, which are uh, where the pro prominent number of where the prominent uh, angles are 60 degrees, or multiples of 60 degrees from one another. Okay, so yes, of course, salt being the most common, uh, and the, you saw the, the formation of that salt crystal structure um, in situ. Okay, so what size ranges can crystals come in? Well, molten lava, when it's cooled, can form a particularly large causeway, a giant's causeway, no less. Uh, these are uh, crystals of basalt that have formed in, an, in a hexagonal. Uh, fashion, but extended in one direction, obviously. Um, this happens with other crystal, crystals at, and at different length scales, different size scales. So there's a cave in Mexico, for example, uh, that has particularly impressive selenite crystals, which are approximately six meters in length. But of course, Giant's Causeway is better. Uh, more familiar the thing that people think of most when we, when discussing crystals, diamonds, of course, on much smaller length scales, and then some of the crystals that we'll be talking about here on the order of 500 microns. But again, uh, that video that I showed you, you were looking at crystals forming on the length scale of uh, tens of nanometers. So much, much smaller again. Um, right, so these are used in the pharmaceutical industry, and they are they're used for for good reason. Uh, this, these are in fact some nicely colored images of single crystals of various pharmaceutical compounds. And the reason that they're preferred in pharmacy is because in order to form a crystal, uh, what we're doing is a method of a method of synthesis that results in a very highly pure end product, assuming we can control it and do it correctly. So. 
examples that are we're going to discuss today and are very common in the, in the pharmaceutical industry and maybe this is what you were expecting to see uh, in the discussion of crystals glutamic acids the alpha and beta form that refers to this to it in fact refers to the molecular arrangements the the the, the arrangement of atoms within the molecules but what results in the difference in those arrangements is an entirely different structure, a different shape. So the alpha form has um, al almost all equal um, proportions, whereas the beta form has a has a wildly preferred, very heavily preferred direction of growth. Um, yes. Similarly, what we look at today, paracetam forms one uh, forms two and three rather. There are other forms, but these ones, like with glutamic acid. Uh, form two uh, has a more even growth uh, has more even growth in every direction, whereas form three has preferred growth along one axis uh, from one face, and that's purely down to the arrangement of atoms within the molecules which go to form the crystals. More familiar again, paracetam paracetamol. Uh, I think everyone is certainly familiar with that. So these compounds are synthesized as pure crystals before being crushed and blended and milled and all sorts of post-processing in order to make sure that these uh, crystals are evenly distributed throughout the tablet so that they can also be evenly distributed uh, and or target specific parts of the body. Okay, so what is the driving force for crystallization? Through it, it, Anyone who's dissolved sugar, and you brought up the example of sugar earlier, anyone who's dissolved sugar to make uh, simple syrup for cocktails in this time of need um, is familiar with how it is easier to dissolve more and more sugar when you increase the temperature. So you can dissolve more and more and more and more sugar up to a point. If you exceed a specific point called a nucleation point, your sugar will start to fall out of solution. Um, there, you can force this nucleation to hap happen by cooling the solution again, but sugar is very stable up to a, a great degree. But this is true of solutions in general. And in fact, what we're going to do here in the lab is to dissolve um, paracetam in uh, isopropyl alcohol. So we're dissolving um, some medicine in alcohol and uh, we're dissolving it by increasing the temperature and then forcing it to nucleate, forcing it to start to form crystals uh, by lowering the temperature. And we're going to lower the temperature uh, slowly enough so that it forms regular crystals. So this, this factor, the driving force, is in fact the supersaturation ratio. And we'll discuss briefly how we can influence the supersaturation ratio. As you are familiar with, in dissolving sugar, if you start off at lower, lower temperature, you can see two lines here, two solubility lines, in fact. Um, if, you start, if you start at a lower temperature, you can't dissolve quite as much. You can't have such a high concentration. You can't have such a high concentration of sugar dissolved. But increasing the temperature allows you to dissolve more and more. And in fact, it's more and more the higher the temperature. But uh, you'll notice that these lines are, in fact, moving together. And this is, this is just a consequence of the fact that uh, we can, in fact, oversaturate or supersaturate the, the solution. We can saturate it to the point where, if we allow the solution to cool, the um, crystals will start to form and fall out of the solution. So what happens then? In fact, there are other ways to induce this. Um, if we're not careful, for example, even if even if it's extremely, uh, even if it's uh, even if it's extremely high temperature, or say for example we've been very careful with what uh, everything um, with cleaning our uh, instruments and so on, even a simple knock can cause something that's oversaturated to nucleate. Um, so what we're going to do, but what we're going to do today is we're going to go to high temperature and just use just by lowering the temperature again with the same concentration, we're going to cause nucleation. Uh, at this point, it's when this is the point at which the solution becomes entirely unstable. But there is a, you'll see that there's a gap between the solubility and the nucleation points in this experiment. Well, this, uh, anywhere along that point, 
you can actually cause nucleation to happen. We're going to cause it today, like I said. Uh, is there a convergence point? It depends on the solution. It depends on the, the what you've dissolved. And uh, yes, so so it, it, what do I mean by it depends on the solution? Well, for example, if in this case, if this is water, uh, it's not. In fact, this is this is um, this is the solubility curve of uh, paracetam in uh, an alcohol. So at no point does this converge because by the time you reach um, Yes, by the time you reach 70 degrees, your solvent starts to boil off. Um, so, in the in th theoretically, though, yes, and there are um, there are solvent solute uh, compositions where you can, in fact, um, in just by following the solubility curve, reach the nucleation point where it automatically nucleates. And in fact, there are some solutions that are so unstable that you can cause nucleation. Uh, simply by scratching the glass. And in fact, if you've ever had uh, a flat pint, sometimes it's because the glass is too new. There are no scratches on the glass and um, no bubbles form. Uh, bubbles are also a form of nucleation that can happen. Uh, similarly here, um, what we're looking at in the center, this represents a highly, highly supersaturated solution into which a seed is added that causes the rest of the solution to nucleate, right? Once it starts to happen, it cascades. Similarly, uh, this can happen, th th this can be triggered by anything that has uh, a rough surface or anything that the solution uh, molecules can interact with, like in the case of just sticking your hand into the reaction. We won't be doing that today, incidentally. Um, okay, so how do we generate supersaturation? Uh, uh, we've discussed one of them already. What we'll do today is cooling can also be achieved by anti-solvent addition. That is where we, we essentially reduce the amount of solvent molecules that are available. Uh, we can do it via, via evaporation. So we slowly increase the concentration of the solution by getting rid of some of the solvent uh, or, or um, reactive, um, reactive addition. So in doing this, what we, uh, we, we, we cause a crystal formation by including two chemicals that react together. Uh, okay. So now at this point, I want to pause again and ask if there, if there are any questions because next step is for to. I want to take you on the tour of the lab. Uh, are there any questions so far? Again, feel free to spam the, the chat box. All good. In fact, um, in fact, before we begin the tour, I might just give people the opportunity to have a bio break, if that's all right. So what we'll do is we'll just leave the we'll just leave the um, the slideshow up, and you can have a bio break, uh, and uh, we'll come back to this um, in five minutes. Okay, welcome back. Uh, hopefully now by you've had the chance uh, to think about what, what's been presented so far and you've come up with some questions. I'm sure you have burning questions that you'd like uh, me to answer. If so, please, again, feel free to spam the chat box while we're waiting for any, anyone else who is to return. Might be away from keyboard. I'll give you a few moments. And just you're back, excellent. Uh, and you like sugar. Yeah, I loved the question about the temper and chocolate. That was excellent. Okay, David, you're you're definitely in the right spirit here. You're making hot whiskey, so you're you're increasing this the ability, <laughs> you're increasing the ability of the the solution. And alcohol is a solution, by the way. Um, <laughs> Uh, yes, by, by heating it up, you are increasing the ability of the solution to dissolve more sugar. I don't recommend it, though, for obvious reasons. Um, alcoholism is bad. Drink, drink responsibly. And uh, also, sugar is bad for your teeth. Um, okay. 
All right. So um, let's let's go on this tour. I want you want you to see some of the things that we have going on here. This is the star of the show. So this is our crystallization reaction vessel. We need some. Ah, thank you. Uh, what we'll do is, in fact, stop the presentation so you can see things more clearly. And yes, uh, just for the sake of um, your own sanity, I encourage you to uh, to maximize the window. View this in full screen so that you can see what's happening. Because in particular, we'll be looking uh, in a few moments at some of the pro process signals. Um, so for the time being, what we have here is a crystallization re reaction vessel. So there's a, there's a solution spinning, being spun by uh, an impeller. So the impeller is being controlled. It's being stirred by an impeller. Uh, the impeller control is up here. Uh, that controls how quickly it, how quickly it is being stirred. There is a, a, a jacket which keeps the reaction uh, inside at a desired temperature. So to control that, we have a chiller. So the chiller um, is controlling it, it, uh, is responsible. It's essentially just refrigeration or heating. It's responsible for del delivering into the jacket. Um, oh, we're getting a lot of questions. Okay, great. Um, oh, it, it's, and we and oh yes. Uh, so if we view this now, does that change your view? I wonder. Oh, that's worked. Okay, just about resizing. Okay, very good. <laughs> we'll continue. Uh, uh, yes, yeah. Let's. We, we'll. We can go in tighter on tighter on this now. So, um, just to, to give you a, cl a a closer view of what's happening, like I said, the chiller is outside controlling the temperature by uh, by controlling the temperature of the fluid in the jacket outside the reactor. So there is. There is a, an inner vessel chamber in which the reaction is happening, and the outer uh, jacket, uh, where um, the chilling fluid is, is is being passed. In this case, it's it's just water, um, but it can be other fluids as well, ethylene uh, glycol or anything like this. So, uh, and on the top here, what we have are the analytical instruments. They're bit, they're inserted uh, from the top. Um, this is just a temperature sensor, but here we have the more advanced um, analytical technology probes. So there's a probe here for um, for FTIR, Fourier Transform Infrared Spectroscopy, and there's a probe here for Raman Spectroscopy. Two of the two of the instruments that we'll discuss later. We also have a probe here uh, of our own for the uh, near infrared spectroscopy. So three spectroscopy techniques that we'll be discussing today. And in fact, that's the reason that we've chosen this reaction to discuss. Okay. Also in the cabinet we have. Um, a fil filtration apparatus that we'll use, uh, vacuum filtration apparatus that we'll use to separate the crystals that we form from the solvent that they're suspended in. Oh yes, and yeah, so the, the, you can see here at the back uh, the red spectrometer, that's our Raman spectrometer busily um, sensing what's happening inside the reaction vi attached via the, via the uh, fiber optics to the probe inside. In the case of, I, I'll discuss this in a moment, but in the case of both the Raman and the uh, both the Raman and the Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, recent developments in fiber optics mean that we can now see inside our processes in line and in real time. We have a bit of legwork to do to interpret the signals. But that's what we're going to talk about today. So, but yes, these are recent developments in which we can use an instrument like this, attached via fiber optics, to see inside the process as it's happening. Similarly, uh, that's also true with the Raman spectroscopy and the near infrared spectroscopy methods, although that's a slightly more mature technology. Okay, yeah. So. As I mentioned earlier, the other control, the main control parameter here uh, is temperature. So we're using a chiller 
to cool the experiment um, from the starting at 50 degrees, bringing it down to approximately five degrees. Yes. All right. So also here in the lab, one of the instruments that we'll be using is the as a simple microscope. We want to show you some of the advantages. It's only by showing you uh, it's only by showing you how time consuming and laborious these the processes. Um, the, so the existing analytical technologies are, um, and we wanted we want to use that to demonstrate some of the advantages of using inline measurements. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is to show you some of what that microscope is seeing and, and show you how those crystals how those crystals look under the microscope. So what we have here is a sample that's been extracted. Oh yes, okay, so what we have here under the microscope is a sample that's been extracted from the process uh, while it was at 50 degrees and just dropped on, onto a slide. Even that process involves, even though that, doing that involves uh, an operator extracting a sample, depositing it on a glass slide and waiting for the solution to evaporate so that we can then view it under the microscope. That's a laborious process, and yes, there are easier methods. That's what people had to do, and what people still do in analytical labs. All right. So I want to do, I'm going to switch to the screen now to show you what what those crystals look like. This is what happened. This is what it looks like. This is what it looks like when crystals are allowed to form in an uncontrolled way. So the crystals cascade out of the solution at lots of different sizes and across different size lengths. Uh, this is not this is not what we're looking for when it comes to uh, pharmaceuticals. We want our crystals to have all of the same shape, all of the same size, and to be ultra pure. If I switch to another slide, here's one I prepared earlier. Uh, on this slide you'll see the, the result of controlling the temperature not just allowing it to cool rapidly to room temperature. This is what this is what the, the samples look like uh, when we deliberately monitor and control and slowly cool the solution over time. We can see there's um, very clearly defined crystals present. And so this is why we want to control our processes. It would be nice if we could control the processes uh, in line, see just by looking at just by looking at how they are um, how the process is progressing in real time, rather than having to extract samples and prepare slides and so on. Okay. So again, I'm going to pause uh, and see if there are any any questions on what we've covered so far. So uh, hopefully, uh, issues around. You know, was everyone able to see that uh, uh, appropriately? Could you see the the screen easily there? Could you see the, the yeah, you could see the slides. Good. Okay. All right, I'll give you the chance to spam with questions. All clear, great. All right, delighted. Okay, so we'll, we'll move on. So what we've seen is, what we've seen is the consequence of allowing the reaction to pr proceed in an uncontrolled way, and I hope that alone is enough to justify controlling the reaction, controlling things slowly. But what we would really need is a method, as, we, as I said, of looking into the process to see how it's, how it's happening and uh, how it's progressing in real time. So for that, we need to look at the sensor data. So I'm going to switch back again to, to, to show you what the sensors are seeing at the moment. So we'll see what the Raman sensor is seeing, and we'll see what the, uh, this is in fact what the Raman sensor is seeing, and it's, it sees a spectrum. We have to process this data in order to interpret it. I'll talk in a moment, uh, in a few minutes, about how to interpret this. But what we're seeing here is um, different wavelengths, or equivalently different wave numbers, and at each wave number we see an intensity. So on, on the y-axis here, this is intensity. Uh, it's a number of counts in the detector. 
So this is showing us the number of counts per wavelength or per wave number equivalently. Uh, similarly, uh, in so this is a spectrum, and this is the, the basis of spectroscopy. Similarly, uh, when we look at the FTIR, I'll go back to the screen like this. Um, when we look at the FTIR, we can see uh, a lot of spectra taken over time. So this here, they are all overlaid. So this might be more familiar to you. Um, uh, yes. Um, and what we can do is, so we can process these spectra to see exactly what, to see exactly regions of interest, how they are changing over time. But again, impossible to interpret this this kind of data with the naked eye. This is these are the signals directly from the sensor. It's now refreshing. It's re capturing more spectra, so it's going to overlay those again on one another. And we can again, as I've mentioned, zoom in. But when it comes to processing the data to to, to see what uh, yes, uh, when it comes to processing the data and interpreting it, we have to take a few extra steps. This is not as simple as just a, an image analysis method. Um, so yes, is there a sampling rate? Uh, sorry, there was a previous question. I'll come back to that. So really, inline is real time. It depends on the it depends on what you're using. I think that's actually related to a sam to the sampling rate question. In fact, yeah, I guess um, you're following a train of thought here. Yeah. So many instruments, many instruments, uh, like opening the shutter in a camera. It takes a certain amount of time for the amount of light to hit the sensor. Um, yeah, and enough light to hit the sensor so that it's, it, 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 it's um, yes, it's, it depends on the sensitivity of the sensor, uh, but yes, you leave the, the you, you allow it to acquire for long enough to detect a strong enough signal. So that's what determines the sampling rate. In the case of, in the case of Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, it's quite fast. You can expect um, approximately uh, one one sample, one acquisition per second. Um, so what we're seeing here is over 16 seconds, 16 samples are collected. Um, there is some processing that has to be done. We'll cover that in a, in a while and so on. So capture, measure, release, and recycle in seconds, exactly. Uh, but in fact, what I should say is that it's, so this is, this is the, detection is happening just by delivering light and capturing the light. So rather than extracting a sample from the process and measuring it and returning it to the process, that's why we have our probes directly positioned into the process. So I'll show you again these probes here. This probe is seeing directly inside the process. It has fiber optic cables that are directed right into the, into the reaction vessel itself. So light is delivered into and then collected from the solution. We'll talk about how that's converted so, so we get actual light signals from the solution as well there. Um, but similarly, with our Raman spectro spectroscopy instrument, uh, laser light is being delivered to the solution and collected. OK, uh, so now it is possible to monitor the crystallization in time. It's possible to monitor the crystallization in, in real time, yes, and in general that's true. Um, we have some steps, thank you, uh, we have some steps to take to process the signal into something useful like concentration. Um, but yes, it is possible to monitor and we're already doing that. We're monitoring the crystallization and we'll just do the extra work to convert that into concentrations. Um, is there a sampling rate? We've answered that. So capture, measure, and release. Yes. If I understand correctly, the technology uses inline sensors, no online or at line. Th that is correct. Although these instruments are capable, you can convert them to at line or online. Uh, now the distinction there, uh, just to focus, is there a lag time? Yes. Um, so uh, it is near real time. That's that's strictly correct. Um, now. Uh, it, so people talk about real time when it, uh, and these terms inline, online, and atline, just to distinguish between those for a moment. Inline is where the the instrument is within the reaction. It's within the within the process. Online is when 
a sample automated or otherwise is removed from the process for the sensor to detect against and then returned to the process. So that's online. Whereas at line is when it's physically removed, where a sample is physically removed from the process and a sensor that is not attached to the process is used for the measurement. So that's inline versus online and at line. Um, so that, yeah, and now Lisa's question, is there a possibility of the physically pro, physical probe triggering more crystallization around the probe? Absolutely, yes. Uh, if it is a light probe, can it be done through the vessel? Yes. Uh, and we'll come to that demonstration later, particularly in the case of near infrared. Uh, other spectroscopy techniques are, are problematic in this regard, but um, near infrared, for example, can be used to deliver light through glass and collect light uh, again. And uh, we'll have more detail on that in a moment. Uh, is it, if it is a light probe, can it be done through the vessel? Uh, and it's absolutely not a silly question. There are no silly questions, um, but that's a really interesting and challenging one. Um, yeah, the lag time, specifically with with um, FTIR, because because the signal um, is uh, sensitive to changes in the presentation of the material, and it has a very narrow uh, penetration, very very narrow penetration depth. The signal is averaged over time. Uh, so, like I said, 16, 16 scans are made um, and then averaged. The, the purpose of this is to eliminate any, uh, to, to account for any noise, to average out any noise, but also to uh, allow you to get a representative view of what's happening in the solution. And that results in a lag. Uh, and yes, it is a moving average. Uh, it, is, it is a moving average. Um, so, um, is there a lag? Cannot be truly real time. Now, uh, other sensors such as such as the near infrared, or in fact, it is possible to use. Uh, uh, in fact, strictly speaking, the, the 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 spectrum from any of these from any of these techniques, because it, there is an acquisition uh, phase, uh, there's an acquisition time. That means that it's not real time. Um, it's not real time. However, the use of chemometrics, uh, the the, uh, the speed of acquisition is extremely fast in some of these detections. With near infrared, for example, you can uh, get a detection on the order of 10 milliseconds, and so quite fast indeed. So very closely approximating real time. So the output signal requires to be characterized to be useful. Absolutely 100% correct. <laughs> I'm glad you asked that question. We're going to talk about how that's achieved. Um, has sound been used to sense such processes? Yes, and in fact, some of the more um, uh, some of the more advanced techniques in, involve entirely other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. But sound itself, I, I, so it's still in the research phases. But sound is used, for example, in the detection of faults. Um, but the same. Uh, analytical techniques that are used to process uh, optical signals can be used to process audio signals. In fact, Fourier transform uh, is the, the uh, is a process is a mathematical process that's applied more often in sound than it is to light. Um, so, have I missed one? When you say average, moving average, it is a moving average in the case of this. Any experience with sensor jabber? Yes, absolutely. And in fact. Um, some sensors have to be designed around um, uh, multi using multiplexing to account for sensor jabber, um, but um, yeah, luckily none of the sensors that we have uh, in house at the moment have have that problem. Uh, I'm drawing a veil there, but that's because, uh, oh, in my experience, in other industries, the trend is more important than the accuracy. Yes. Is that the case for the Raman technology, or, or, or is, is accuracy the key parameter? OK, so yes. Um, it, so there, there, is, there is even an application of, there is even an application of uh, NIR, for example, blend, uh, analysis of blend or content uniformity, uh, where the only important factor is the trend. 
and COVID numbers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> not all is all. Thanks for <laughs> we're experiencing technical difficulties. <laughs> no, no, no. No, good. Does it support? Oh, yeah. Okay. Very good. Well, so some sensors can be used to monitor blend or content uniformity. That's that's the degree of mix of the mixture, and in, obviously in pharmaceutical uh, manufacturing as well as in food and other uh, sectors, other types of manufacturing. It's it's important to have a uniform mixture. It's important so that you have even distribution of your pharmaceutical ingredient within the tablet. It's important in food so that you have an even distribution of flavor uh, in your um, in your cornflakes, <laughs> etc. So we when we're monitoring this, we could uh, start monitoring all of the different concentrations of all of the elements present. Or we could just keep monitoring until changes slow down and stop. Another example is the fermentation in beer or cider production. The trend is more important than the accuracy of the degree of fermentation. Yeah, absolutely. And exactly the same, and for exactly the same reasons, uh, monitoring blend uniformity or content uniformity, uh, which is where we analyze the distribution of an active pharmaceutical ingredient within a tablet. Um, yeah, the, we're we're interested in mixing until it's well mixed, until it's homogenous. And obviously, if the signal changes with res, in response to changes in the concentration of what's present, when the changes slow down and when it stops changing, it means our our mixture is is well blended. Okay, so the trend there is more important than the uh, the final values, but for some processes. And particularly, particularly for for uh, for processes where you need to know that you've uh, processed to a specific concentration, the the only way is to use chemometrics with your process and analytical technology, where you convert the signal into concentration concentration or other or, or other information. Okay, so. Um, I want to take you now through some of the details on the process analytical technology. Uh, I realize you've been very engaged with the questions. It's been, it's been fantastic. Please continue. If you have any more questions, um, you can continue to ask them. I'm going to switch over to the presentation now again. Uh, so we'll continue from there. Okay, so, so we're going to talk about the process analytical technology that you've seen so far today. So we've, um, we've been using this, obviously, to monitor glycation reaction, in which there are process parameters uh, that we can change. So there's the cooling rate, there's the initial temperature, there's the initial supersaturation, because we can continue to dissolve more and more as long as the as long as the, the the nucleation isn't encouraged, we can we can in fact start the nucleation process in the middle of the supersaturation region that we discussed. Um, we can start it by introducing a seed on which the reaction can start to nucleate, or we can change the seed amount or even the seed location. And yeah, of course, we can control the agitation speed as, as well, the rate at which it's stirred. So those are the parameters that affect nucleation and growth. I also want you to I also want to discuss the critical quality attributes. So if we look at this, we're, we're forming a pharmaceutical ingredient. We're, we're synthesizing a pharmaceutical ingredient here. So we have to consider the the attributes, the qualities. <laughs> the quality attributes of the end product in this in this process, and the critical quality attributes, the things that determine how good our end product is, those are crystal size distribution, the purity of the crystal, desired polymorph, and yield. Now, polymorph may be unfamiliar with those without a back, background in chemistry, but in fact, so a, a polymorph is simply a different crystalline 
arrangement, by which I mean uh, the difference between soot, which is carbon, and diamond, which is also carbon, and exciting things like graphene, less exciting things like graphite in the lead of your pencil. Those are all just carbon crystals. Uh, in the case of soot, it's amorphous, but um, different arrangements of carbon atoms, um, those are different, essentially different polymorphs. Today, in our experiment, we have, uh, as I mentioned, we're using paracetam, which has the two different forms, two different um, presentations that result in different shapes of crystals. So we can distinguish between the polymorphs that are present. Okay, so those are the critical quality attributes, the things that define how good an end product we have. And we can use our PAT to monitor these. Before we get there, I want to prompt you to, to, to relate back to me. I want to see, I want to see um, if you can guess, based on the critical quality attributes, what are the challenges in crystallization? And again, I want you to spam the chat box and I'll, I'll monitor it uh, to see if there are any exciting developments. But you've already hit on a lot of this um, in the questions that you've been asking. my wild whiskey with the white consistency and sweetness, absolutely. Okay, well, I'll prompt you. <laughs> whiskey and chocolate, <laughs> I can. <laughs> well, I mean, who wouldn't want to be in the class about whiskey and chocolate? If only there were some magical way of combining the two. Determining the correct range of the process parameters. Yeah, exactly. Okay, <laughs> perfect. All right. So challenges here: uh, yield, purity, undesired forms, size distribution. So size distribution refers to uneven distribution. Uh, if the particles, if the crystals grow too large and your stir speed is too high, that can cause crystal breakage. Um, controlling the, the crystal size. And um, so even after the crystals have nicely formed, they can still agglomerate. But all of these things can be controlled by controlling our process parameters. But to get there, we have to be able to see what's happening in the moment. Uh, the example of crystal breakage is a good one. If our crystals grow too large, they can, um, they can break off each other. You'll also see this in oral solid dose manufacturing. Uh, which you'll see in another demonstration, another virtual tour, uh, breakage of granulates. They, we, we want to form granulates of a desired size, but if you dry the material too much, uh, the granules become too fragile and brittle and break off one another. Okay, so we can use our process parameters as long as we're getting decent signal. A question? So yeah, several, region, several reasons for uh, an uneven distribution. Uh, so um, one of the examples that we looked at earlier with the, the, the slide when it's, where the crystals were allowed to just fall out of um, form uh, rapidly, uh, cooling in air, uh, you get um, a crystallization that's not homogeneous. Small crystals form as well as large, uh, as well as large crystals. So uh, the Smaller crystals can clump together to form to form agglomerates, um, but in in when the speed of crystallization, when the, the, the when the speed of nucleation isn't controlled, um, what results is an uneven distribution of end product through agglomeration and through uh, different forms being present. Um, the freezing of boiling boiling water is via an ideal crystal process. So. I think this was re in reference to um, uh, uh, videos circulating around the internet where you can take boiling water. Uh, this is actually probably more true of um, just where you take boiled water uh, true, uh, to mean that it is quicker. Uh, yes, okay. So, um, so yes, it is. Freeze, and there's good good reason for that. What what's happening in in that case is that 
because there is so much energy in the suspension, when it's rapidly cooled, uh, there are far more nucleation sites. So it's, um, yes, it freezes, it, it freezes much more rapidly when you're starting from, from <laughs> but this is something that can only <laughs> be believed by seeing the demonstration. And unfortunately, that is not something I'm going to demonstrate in the lab today, but it is something that you can uh, look for yourself on YouTube. Uh, I believe it was in Siberia, there were extreme uh, temperatures, uh, freezing temperatures, where people, can, where people went outside with boiling water and threw it into the air. Uh, and as, they, as, they, um, as they threw the, the boiling water into the air, it froze in, while in midair into ice. So yes, there, um, there are so many possible nucleation sites because of the fact that the water is so energetic. Uh, that um, with so many nucleation sites, so many crystals form that um, soak up all of the energy, withdrawing the energy from the boiling water, uh, bringing it to freezing immediately. So again, uh, that I, I know that that needs to be seen to be believed. I didn't believe it myself until I saw it. Um, <laughs> my PhD was in crystal formation, so. Um, but yes, uh, definitely worth a watch. Um, okay. So we know why we have to look at our process. We're going to talk about how to do it. Absorption spectroscopy is the simplest. So we'll start with that. It involves uh, molecular vibrations. So different kinds of molecular vibrations correspond to different energies at a molecular level. What we're looking at here is a simple water molecule. And what, what you're seeing here is different ways in which the molecule can bend and stretch and move depending on its energy. So there's symmetric stretching where hydrogen atoms pull away from the oxygen uh, symmetrically, asymmetric st stretching, rocking, rocking motions. Genuinely, the, the, the atoms can rock back and forth uh, around the, the hydrogen atom, scissoring where they move together, wagging and twisting. Water is a very good molecule for demonstrations. Um, because if it, it does all of these different kinds of uh, molecular vibrations. Uh, at a molecular level, these things happen to water. So what happens when light hits a molecule like this? Well, it can be absorbed. If the energy of the light is, I see that some of the text is off, uh, behind, hidden behind the, gra the graph here. I'll try to fix that later. But what happens is, Light can be absorbed when the energy of the light is the same as one of those vibrations. That means that we can use light um, to determine what's inside the process. We can determine what vibrations are present, and we can, from there, determine uh, determine what uh, molecules are, what atom, atom, atoms and molecules are causing that uh, vibration or causing that absorption. So one of the ways to do this is to measure the output of your light source and disperse it using a grating. So this is where light is reflected off something white. And then the light that's reflected is spread out physically in space. It's dispersed. Uh, you can do this with a CD. And I'm sure you've produced a, uh, you've seen the light reflected from a CD. Uh, you can see the, the rainbow distribution. So that's, a dis that's working as a dispersion grating because the lines are so close together, they're almost on the same size as the wavelength of the light. And what happens is that the, the light spreads out in space. So we see all of the constituent colors. So we can attach detectors to these. We can attach a uh, detector to, to these. Uh, to, so we can spread out the Dete separate detectors uh, have a linear detector array to tell us how much light is hitting. So the intensity of the light that's hitting each element of the array, and that tells us uh, the wavelength of the light as well as the intensity. So this tells us that um, we can convert this into a spectrum right, by, collecting the, by collecting the intensity observed at each of the different wavelengths, at each of the different detectors. And from there, yeah, we produce uh, a spectrum. This is of the perfectly reflective surface. 
and we can compare that to a sample. So by comparing light from a known reflectance standard to that of our unknown sample, we can measure the difference. And that tells us about what's present, what's absorbing in the sample. Okay. So in the case of in the case of water, uh, in the near infrared, for example, uh, what we would see are, are two absorption peaks. We see one absorption peak at a, uh, around uh, 1,450 nanometers, and another absorption peak at around 1,900 nanometers. So by shining near infrared light into into a vessel containing water, we can see these two peaks. Uh, so we can determine if we have a solution, whether it's water or not. Water has peaks, like I mentioned, at 1450 and 1900. Uh, so alcohols, <laughs> like whiskey, have a peak uh, slightly higher uh, uh, in each case. Sorry, I seem to have lost my mouse. Oh, here it is. Um, at each case, slightly higher, and in fact has a double peak around 1900. So different, different uh, molecules and, and the presence of different molecules um, can be de detected using uh, by just looking just simply by looking at the peaks that are present or absent. Uh, in the case of hydrocarbons, for example, there are th three peaks present in the in the near infrared region of space. Uh, so by a near infrared region, there is a, a, a there is a spectrum of uh, elect so there's the electromagnetic spectrum. This is these are a range of different wavelengths. Light is a, is is uh, the light that we can see is a, a subset of this spectrum from about uh, uh, 400 nanometers to approximately 750 nanometers. <clears throat> there then there is the invisible light range which we can feel but we can't see. Uh, there is, in fact, invisible light at both ends of that spectrum, ultraviolet light that we have to protect ourselves against because it's it's damaging to skin. Uh, infrared light that we can feel that we can feel heat being transferred through infrared light, and you can see it with an infrared camera. Then there's the so uh, the infrared region can be broken up into sub regions, and here the near infrared is the part of the spectrum that's near the visible. Uh, uh, part of the inf electromagnetic spectrum. When we talk about Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, what we're discussing there is the mid infrared region, but in fact it goes uh, further again. Uh, Raman spectroscopy is, is also typically carried out in the region, um, in, in the high visible range or uh, low near infrared range. Okay, so. So, light interacts, interacts with molecules by being absorbed. When the, that light is absorbed, we can detect uh, by comparing light that's um, been exposed to a reflective material and a light that's been exposed to the sample, we can compare the, uh, the, the two spectra to determine what was absorbed by that, spe spe by that sample. So that tells us what molecules were present. Now, as I mentioned, and I, I thought I'd give you a close-up of the instruments and how they're inserted. So we have two probes that we're going to discuss for the crystallization reaction. There's an ATR FTIR probe and a Raman probe. So the Raman sensor, the Raman probe itself, is delivering laser light into the reaction vessel and collecting it again. The ATR FDIR probe is doing the, sa the same. In this case, ATR means attenuated total reflectance, and FDIR stands for Fourier Transform Infrared Spectroscopy. I'll give you a brief description of what those are. In the case of Fourier Transform Infrared Spectroscopy, we have an infrared light source. That's what was sitting out on the bench. And it's producing infrared light that's delivered into into the sample. Now, things can happen when light is delivered to a sample. When we, uh, it, it can be reflected, it can be absorbed, 
and the rest of the light that's that doesn't get absorbed is transmitted through. Other things can happen, but just for the purposes of this description, I think that's that's sufficient. What I've mentioned so far was absor absorption spectroscopy. Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy involves a particular kind of light. So this is infrared laser, an infrared laser is first used in the light source to generate an interference pattern. And that's what's used to illuminate the sample. Some of that light is then absorbed and some is transmitted uh, due to the arrangement of the electrons and the absorptions of, by the molecule. And what is detected can then tell us two things. The peak position can tell us what molecules are present, the molecular structure, and the height and the area of the peaks can tell us the concentration. So we'll go into further detail in Fourier transform in, during the uh, lecture that we'll have with you in, I think, week seven. But for the time being, that's the fundamental principle of how Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy works. Uh, but there was another part to this that I mentioned. The, well, yes, and we'll only concern ourselves with absorptions and transmission today. Um, but here, uh, attenuated total reflectance uh, is the other part. That's the, that's the part that allows FTIR, which is traditionally just a benchtop method, the attenuated to total reflectance allows us to deliver the light into the, into the reaction vessel and collect signal from the reaction fluid itself. Okay, so in this case, the infrared source is delivered, it's bounced back and forth, the light bounces back and forth, it's, it's, there's total reflectance, reflectance inside, that, inside a crystal, um, uh, inside the reaction vessel, and the light is then collected by fiber optics, brought back to the detector. But again, a light that's re reflected from, from the sample solvents, uh, solvent molecules tells us what those solvent molecules are. So we use attenuated total reflectance, FTIR, to determine uh, what, is this, what things are still dissolved in the solution. But again, it produces a, a spectrum like, we, like we've seen. Raman spectroscopy, on the other hand, so in this case, light is, laser light is scattered from molecules. Some of the light is scattered shorter in, uh, at shorter wavelengths, some at longer wavelengths. Uh, it's just due to the molecules that are present and, their, and their, how much energy they, are, they have, their excitation states, what kinds of vibrations they're undergoing. Raman scattering, though, has much narrower peaks than the absorption spectroscopy that I mentioned earlier, the near-infrared. And here, the shape tells us, uh, the shape of the peaks tells us a lot more. Peak position tells us the molecular structure, like with FTIR. Peak height can tell us the concentration, but the sh peak shift can tell us the stresses within the crystal, and the peak width can tell us the degree of crystallinity or how amorphous the, the structure is. Okay, and again, we see that some of the text is hidden by the graph. But yes, so those are some of the parameters that we can, we can monitor. So in the case, peak shift, is this where we see many peaks? In fact, we have an example of uh, peak shift right here. So, um, so the, the, uh, in this case, what we have are, uh, we have the, uh, we've overlaid the spectrum, the Raman spectrum from form two uh, uh, paracetam over form three paracetam. These are different polymorphs and we saw that they had different crystal structure. But, um, but the molecular arrangement, uh, the difference in the molecular arrangement can be detected using Raman, looking at how the peak, peaks have changed from one form to the other. So that's what's, that's what's referred to as peak shift here. Um, so a shift from the, in the position of the peak from one to another, or a shift in the shape of the, the overall shape of the peak from one form to another. Okay. Uh, any any other questions at the moment? All right. Uh, so as I mentioned, the peaks that are present, peak position tells us what molecular structure, uh, peak height, the concentration, peak shift tells us about the stresses in the crystal, and 
peak width degree of crystallinity. The relative heights of the peaks. Um, so this is from the peak, from the top of the peaks to the to the to the troughs, or from the peak to the baseline. So the baseline uh, can be a measure of, um, of of signal from the crystal itself, but it can also be a signal from uh, the solution. So the baseline uh, is one of the things that we sometimes have to remove um, because it can be attributed to the background and the stray light that's present. And you'll see that you saw earlier that the reaction is open to uh, light from the laboratory. And our floodlights, for example, could even influence the, the experiment. Um, but it's, the background can also be due to an, the presence of an amorphous material. So, for example, uh, I mentioned soot, but perhaps an easier thing to, to, um, to well, a more familiar uh, thing to discuss here is, is glass. When we, compare, when we compare glass to diamond, we know that glass is, is brittle, but in fact, um, absolutely. Um, sorry, I spotted a question there. Um, well, I'll come back to the question in just a moment, in fact. So, <laughs> although I, 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 with a question around 5G uh, and so on, I, I hope we're not getting into conspiracy theory um, territory here. But just, ju just in comparing glass to diamond, uh, glass or glass to, to what we call crystal um, uh, is, an, is another example. Um, glass is, in fact, uh, on a uh, on when we look at the atomic arrangement of glass, although glass is very brittle and shatters into large shards, um, it's, it's, it is in fact amorphous. It, it, it's not, there, are, there are not crystals present, but the, um, as distinct from crystal, as in crystal glassware, which, uh, in which crystals are present. And this is why, um, this is why we can, we can um, when we look at, when we look at uh, signals through glass, we have to subtract uh, the, the the background because it's it's got a signal that does not have any peaks. To um, yeah, so we have to remove that from our process. We have to move that from the, remove that from the scan. Uh, if we were to look at if we were to try and look at the same process through a crystal, we'd find that yes, essentially it is noise. It's it's signal at all wavelengths perhaps not even uh, at the same, to the same degree, to the same intensity, but it is that kind of background um, produced by amorphous materials being present, it, it is noise. And for that reason, we have to remove it. Uh, okay, so the other question that I skipped over and said I wanted to come back to, could high frequency signals, Bluetooth, 3G, 4G, and so on also impact? Depending on what you, uh, depending on the wavelength range of your detector, absolutely, those signals, um, those those signals are electromagnetic signals, and they are in this. If you have a de detect detector that's sensitive in in those ranges, then it will absolutely interfere. Okay, interesting. Right. So what we're see starting to see now in our experiment, we'll just switch back to the experiment very briefly what we're starting to see already is that the solution has become cloudier the solution has cooled now uh, uh, we've been slowly cooling it and at the moment it is at approximately 16 degrees so what we're seeing here is the start of the nucleation and that's causing the the, the suspension to become cloudy and in fact it might yeah uh, what we'll see later on is how this how this has an influence on the, the start of nucleation, how that has an influence on the, the prediction of the concentration. But to get there, we'll, yeah. So we'll, what we'll do is continue now with, um, we'll allow the reaction to, to continue and we'll allow it to progress. Uh, well, you, that stir, there, there's an artifact just from the video capture that that stir is spinning continuously. In fact, it's spinning at, a, a, I think about, 200 revolutions per minute, but just because of the way the video is capturing uh, and the refresh rate of the video, uh, 
uh, it, it looks like it's stuttering, but it's not. It's moving. It's moving smoothly. Um, and but yes, you can see there. Even as I'm speaking, the solution is becoming cloudier and cloudier as the as more and more crystals form. Okay. Uh, so to continue with the presentation, then um, we're looking at today at the crystallization of paracetam, and the solvent is isopropyl alcohol (IPA), uh, an alcohol that's used for cleaning electronics and uh, and so on. And what you're seeing here is the solubility curve that I discussed earlier. Uh, again, if you start off at five degrees. Uh, at five degrees Celsius, you can only uh, you can only dissolve uh, in a stable solution. You can only dissolve approximately five grams per liter, uh, five grams of paracetam per liter of the of uh, alcohol. Uh, but at fifty degrees, in fact, I think we started really at, um, uh, at at fifty degrees. But we first started looking at the reaction when it was at forty degrees. Um, at forty degrees, you can see that the amount that we can keep dissolved is much, much higher. It's in fact uh, about 30 grams per liter, about six times, six times more um, of, the, uh, of paracetam can be dissolved at 40 degrees. So well, by cooling it back down, we're going to force, and we've already started to force this nucleation to happen because the solution has become now super, super saturated. Okay. Uh, the numbers is that the, is that an, is this a linear regression? Well, uh, this is a polynomial regression, and we will discuss we will discuss linear regression with respect to with respect to comparing our um, yeah we will compare our reference data to our signal data, um, but this is just a, a polynomial. Uh, expression that relates the solubility to the temperature. Okay. Um, so yes, on chemometrics, I said it is applied statistics. And uh, so for those of you uh, who aren't, who have no background in chemistry, um, this you might expect from the term, from the terminology used, you might expect this to be less relevant. But I can assure you, this is. This is a requirement of digital transformation technologies uh, for any manufacturing process that uses process analytical technologies, um, any, anything around spectroscopy. But even if, even if you're not using spectroscopy in your process, you're still using exactly the same statistical methods uh, to convert your data into, into usable um, process information. Chemometrics is just the easiest way of applying your, applying statistics and, and getting meaningful process data. But I want you to discuss something for me. I, I want you to take a, a few minutes as well to think about this. We might have another bio break while you're thinking about it. Correlation does not imply causation. This is common knowledge. When I put up common knowledge before about right angles, um, I provided counterexamples. No right angles, but and yet, in fact, nature does have right angles in it. So, why am I? It might be controversial to say that correlation does imply causation. Any takers? Why am I so confident that, that it does imply causation when there are examples like this? This is the per capita consumption of mozzarella cheese on the left uh, versus the civil engineering doctorates that are awarded on the right. So clearly, there's a correlation between the two. You can see that they track so closely together, there must be a correlation. This is what we mean by a correlation. Uh, oh, I've missed one, have I? Uh, I must be overlaid. OK, I'll retrieve the other uh, after, the, uh, after we have a, a bio break. But I want you to think about this. Despite the spurious correlation that I'm showing you here, I still claim that correlation does imply causation. So I want you to think about that during the bio break, and we'll we'll come back to discuss it. I am so happy. Okay. <laughs> All right, uh, that's exactly the right answer. Correlation doesn't prove causation, but the info you get can lead you to further study because it does imply causation. Exactly right. 
100%. I wish I could give out gold stars or chocolate bars and whiskeys for that answer. Uh, I'm very happy. But yeah, we'll leave it there for the moment and, and take a, a five minute, a 10, 10 minute. Yeah, okay. We'll, we'll give people 10 or 15 minutes, do you think? Yeah. Well, all right. We'll go for full 15 minutes. Uh, because you'll give yourself a gold star. Uh, all right, I'll see if I can arrange a virtual gold star as well in the meantime. Uh, so yes, uh, take 15 minutes, please, and we'll, that'll bring us back for, let me see, 10 to, yeah, so that'll bring us back uh, 10 to 12. All right, I'll leave this presentation up, uh, this part of the presentation up for the time being. Okay, uh, thanks, Chris. Um, welcome back, everyone. Uh, you know, I hope you could see that the reaction was progressing there. And uh, in fact, I found the other correlation here. Um, apparently, the total revenue generated by arcades correlates very well with computer science doctorates awarded in the US. So I think here there is an implied correlation, uh, but uh, as well. So. Can we prove that the two things are connected? No, we can't. That is not what correlation does. It just implies correlation. It doesn't prove it. Exactly as Deirdre said. And I hope you saw your gold star there, Deirdre. OK. Oh, there we are. <laughs> OK. Excellent. Uh, all right. So um, uh, before I move on, are there any other questions? Are there any questions about the topics that I've covered uh, so far? <laughs> You're very welcome, Deirdre. You deserve it. Okay, so if there are no other questions, feel free to pop it, you know, to, to, to ask your questions. Um, okay, great. Glad to hear it. Glad to hear it. Uh, okay, so correlation, what does it mean? Well, on the left, you can see an example of strong positive correlation. On the right, you can see an example of weak positive correlation. So correlation is when we compare two sets of data, two variables um, against one another. A positive correlation is when, we, we sh when the data tells us that when one grows, so does the other, or at least that they seem to grow together. <laughs> correlation um, implies causation, but like we said, does not prove it. On the left, it is strong positive correlation because all of the data is clustered together around the trend line. Uh, a regression is done here 
to determine what the relationship is between all of the data. And on the left, what we see is that all of the data clusters around very close to this uh, trend line. On the right, we see that the data more follows the same direction. It follows the same relationship, but the data isn't clustered so tightly around the, the regression line, around the trend line. Okay. This can be described with a correlation coefficient, and there are multiple correlation coefficients. Uh, on the left, you see again our strongly correlated, uh, strongly positively correlated uh, data set. Um, as we move toward the mi middle, that correlation becomes less and less strong until in the middle it's impossible to see a correlation. That corresponds to a, a Pearson um, correlation coefficient of zero. On the left, with strongly positive uh, correlation, that's um, a Pearson coefficient of one. And on the right, negative one, uh, negative one, where there is a very strong correlation, but uh, as one increases, the other decreases. On the left, where uh, one increases, the other increases too. Okay. So, in order to resolve uh, the correlation between things, and in order to translate that correlation, to use that translate uh, correlation to go from signal to concentration, for example, what we do is we record the spectra at different concentrations. We measure our concentrations, so for our, that's for our comparative data set. We can prepare spectral, spectral data for that correlation, so that's our, so if there's any processing that we have to do, and I will, I'll discuss different processing. Uh, yes, that was the Pearson correlation coefficient that we just, uh, that I just mentioned. There are others, uh, Spearman's, um, so, so R squared is often used uh, to correlate two data sets, that's the coefficient of determination, uh, and they have different functions. We'll discuss some of those later on. But we record spectra at different concentrations in order to prepare a chemometric model. We can measure concentrations or use known concentrations for comparative data. We might have to prepare our spectra by removing a background, for example, or other spectral pretreatments. I'll mention, uh, I'll take you through later uh, in a moment. So then we calibrate, we do the correlation, we compare the spectral data and our reference data, our comparative data. Final step, particularly uh, for uh, in, in GMP and um, in GMP environments, we have to validate the model that we produce against unknown concentrations. And then we uh, verify that the model works in real time to achieve the predictive accuracy that we need. So there's quite a few steps there to go from signal to useful uh, prediction. But those steps go far beyond that. In fact, at step four there, we've already achieved what we want to. We've already developed our model. The rest is about validating. Okay, so background subtraction. We discussed it. This is how it can look. So we start, when we record our spectrum, we might be looking through glass. So our initial spectrum is a combination of the signal from the sample and the signal from the glass. So we have to remove that, like we have to remove noise. And in fact, identical processing techniques are used to remove noise. Noise is removed in lots of different ways, depending on the spectroscopy method. Fourier transform is one of uh, is one of those um, transformations that, that's used to make noise reduction, in particular, easier. But in in every case, it's a matter of subtracting the background spectrum from our signal to get the corrected spectrum. So this is a way of preparing our spectra. The other steps that we can take to prepare our spectra. Oh, in fact, let's just discuss uh, what that gives us. So once we once we have these corrected spectra, we can use that raw, almost raw data in the case of um, one type of uh, model development that we use here today. Uh, we can already use that all near raw data just after after the background is removed to do peak area analysis. As I mentioned earlier, peak area correlates very strongly to uh, the concentration present. So 
peak height does as well. Um, the peak area is uh, a little bit more robust after background is subtracted. And I'll discuss that in just a moment. But yes, yeah, suffice it to say that what you're looking at here is uh, in blue, the peak area versus um, over, over time throughout the cooling experiment. And uh, in yellow, what you're seeing is the, the temperature as it's controlled by, and measured by the, the chiller. And in fact, very briefly, I want to just show you what the chiller has been doing throughout this experiment, because we looked at it right at the beginning, but I want to show you the data that, was, that it was producing to show how it was being controlled. So I'm going to go back over here to our, to where the Jolibo chiller is in action and has been throughout the process. So what we're seeing here, there are three different measurements coming from the chiller. One of them in red is the set point. So initially it was set at 50 degrees, then it was changed to, this was all recipe, recipe driven. Sorry, I realize I neglected to, to close my presentation um, so that we can see this. And for those of you on the web, I think now you can see a much better picture, I hope. Um, okay, so what we're looking at uh, here in red, if I make this full screen, that will stop the clutter. You can see how this was controlled. This is a this is recipe driven. This is recipe driven control. Ah, I see. Sorry, I believe there was a problem with the audio, um, which I made work. Uh, okay, so yeah, what we're looking at here in red was the set point. Initially, the temperature of the chiller was set at fifty degrees. It was uh, in, in the recipe, the next step was to go to 40 degrees and then to slowly allow the temperature of the reaction to drop down to uh, five degrees. So that was the, those were the steps in the process and the steps in the recipe. And we can actually see uh, in, in blue, that's the temperature of the jacket. That's the, the fluid in the jacket around the reaction itself. Um, so we can see how that responded to the changes in the set point. So initially, it, plummeted uh, as the chiller cooled extremely rapidly to try to get to 40 degrees. The, um, the jacket temperature climbed back up, uh, fluctuated around the, the, the set point before coming, coming down in stages and so on to where it is now at five degrees. In green, what you see is that ac the actual temperature measured in the reaction with that probe that we looked at earlier. So you can see that in fact, it dipped slightly below 40 degrees, was held at 40 degrees for some time, and then followed with some lag. It followed behind the set temperature um, until it was brought down, overshooting a little bit, as these temperatures always do, uh, before coming back up to five degrees. Okay, so this is, um, I'm going to switch back over now. I'm going to switch back over now to the to the presentation. Um, so what we're showing what we're showing here in yellow was the set point was the set point of of the chiller over uh, over time. Um, interesting questions here. I understand. Uh, let me see. I've been missing the questions as I was over at the. Uh, I need to expand this chat box. I'll go back up to the top. Um, okay, Pearson, yes, we were here. And so I assume all the sensors are using timestamp, yes, as key, and we are blending readings at the timestamp. Exactly right. How do we ensure that each device is on at the same time? So they, in, in fact, in this case, they're uh, each controlled, the timestamps are controlled by the same uh, device. But it is a, it, it is a question um, that, that challenges particularly older equipment that isn't, and it's one of the just one of the good justifications for for connecting all of your devices uh, to the internet. Cybersecurity issues and all to one side, but the, but the point is, if um, if you don't have uh, something central that's applying a timestamp uh, to each yes clunk, the clock sync is a pain. Then uh, you you have to have some other method uh, web. Synchronization is one of the methods employed. In our case, we've kept it very simple for the purpose of this experiment by running all of the equipment through the same sensor, uh, through the same uh, IPC, industrial PC. Okay, uh, so yes, even something as simple as 
re removing the background and focusing on one specific peak allowed us to map the changes in concentration. And that kind of simple analysis can be, can be done as well um, using a, a type of regression known as principal component um, analysis. Now, I'll get into more detail on principal components, component analysis um, during the lecture. Suffice it to say for today that principal component analysis is, is a way of reducing the number of dimensions, reducing the complexity of the information uh, to a simple form to do a simple kind of analysis like this. So I'll explain that in a little bit more detail now and then further detail during the, um, during the lecture. But before we get to that, I want to show you uh, another way of preparing spectra called normalization and mean centering. So normalization might be familiar, but it's where, for example, uh, the signal uh, that's returned from, uh, from inside your reaction or inside your process, if it, if it changes due to, say, um, the penetration depth of your, of your illumination, if it changes due to uh, changes in vibration in the system, some those that kind of those kinds of changes are not actually they don't they don't actually correspond to changes in the concentration. So there are methods of uh, adjusting the the relative intensities so that they match up, and that's called normalization. It's one of the techniques in normalization. So this is another way of overlaying uh, your spectra in a meaningful way, so that you uh, eliminate fluctuations that are due to um, uh, due to process changes that aren't of interest and focusing only on those changes like changes in concentration that are of interest. So normalization, mean centering are very often used to prepare spectra and as I mentioned earlier dimension reduction. So in, what we do here is well the justification here we can see on, on, on the left, our spectrum is a number of signals. In fact, for every detector, in our, for every pixel in our detector, if we have a linear detector array, we have a separate signal. So we have a lot of data, we have a lot of things we could use to, um, to plot against our concentration, but not all of it might be re relevant. It might only be some combinations of certain peaks that have to do with changes in our concentration. So principal component analysis tries to, uh, well, principal component analysis and partial least squares regression, any kind of regression, the first step is, uh, involves reducing the number of dimensions, the, the number of variables to only those which actually change with the change of interest, in our case, a change in concentration. Okay, so in the, in the illustration shown, what you're looking at is a three-dimensional graph. And we can see that our what we've, we've plotted it against three variables, but in fact, had we plotted it against these two components instead, so this uh, small set of axes, axes here, we would see that our data is much more spread out and that the variations between them uh, give us much more information about the real changes in the process. Okay, so, what do we do then once we've got our once we've oh sorry once we've done our regression analysis once we've compared known concentration or known attribute critical quality have we got a question there how many dimensions are typical that PCA reduces how many PCA components would we reduce to to to, to two or three okay that's a good question and it it depends on unfortunately, on the details of the data. So how many dimensions are typical that the PCA reduces? They can be in the thousands. And in fact, that's a good justification. And in the case of our, in the case of our um, Raman spectrometer, there are literally 1,024 separate signals. Uh, so it, principal component analysis tries to find some combination of the 
the different changes in, in peak height on all of those. The light is, is an example. Um, PCA tries to identify principal component analysis, tries to find what combinations of signals from all of those pixels uh, changes most closely with the change in concentration. In fact, changes most dramatically over the course of the experiment. And it presents you with uh, quite a few principal components. But you're, how many should be reduced to two or three? Well, so the principal components, what it's doing there is it tries to find, uh, the, the analysis tries to find the, um, the ways in which your data is changing the most. And it, it then gives you, uh, uh, in order of highest priority, it gives you the, the components, the dimensions in which it changes the most, the components in which it changes the most. So for example, your first component might uh, correspond to 80% of all of the variation in your data set. Your second component might correspond to another 15%. So within the first two components, you've already got 95% of the variance in the data being explained. Okay, so I realize this is at a very high and abstract level. We'll provide you with concrete examples when we look at some of the data now in a moment. Um, but yes, I think I see the next question. Unfortunately, my video is frozen. I can't read it. Oh, here we are. Uh, so we want to account for the majority of the variance. We want our principal component analysis to, to account for the majority of the variance, yes. And what the procedure is, then we identify which of the principal components, when they are ordered from most variance to least variance, actually track with the, um, the, the, the changes of interest. Like for example, in the case of our experiment, our principal components, there is a change in, in um, like I mentioned, infrared heat. So that means that temperature affects an infrared signal. So it might be that the principal component number one, the first, the highest order um, principal component, that which changes the most with our experiment is actually just one that would track the temperature. And only the second component tracks the, the second most important component, um, the tracks with the concentration. So we have to analyze, we have to look at our data to see, uh, to, to, to interpret, to apply inter interpretations. There are, method, there are mathematical methods to do this by looking at scores and loadings. We can discuss that later as well, uh, but yes, Principal component analysis is used to account for the majority of the variance in your data to separate out which of those variances are to do with um, process changes and which of those are, have to do with process changes of interest, process changes that relate to our critical quality attribute. Okay, so I intended that to be a much higher level uh, discussion. I hadn't intended to get into it here, but a uh, very good question. Um, Okay, so to get back to this, what we have in say uh, partial least squares, partial least squares regression, where we're comparing, uh, we're carrying out this regression, looking at the regression coefficients, um, comparing the known critical quality attribute to the predicted critical quality attribute. And if I recall correctly, this was uh, an experiment looking at concentrations of um, salicylic acid in um, mixed in lactose. Uh, so aspirin in milk, <laughs> in milk powder. No, very often la lactose is a powder that's used in the pharmaceutical industry to disperse, um, to, to disperse the active pharmaceutical ingredient. And acetyl salicylic acid is the active ingredient in, uh, in, in aspirin. Okay, so this, so when we can compare the predicted concentration to the known concentration, this can tell us quite a lot about, well, first of all, it can tell us about the, the data set that we used to make the calibration. But when we then, this means that we have built a model and we see how all of the data behaves. We see how much 
uh, of the variance in the data is explained by the model. That's what the R squared tells us. So here it's telling us that 93%, 94% of the variance in the data is explained by that model. And another parameter that's reported here is a root mean squared error of cross-validation. And it's low, that's good. That means this model is performing well. But again, I'll go, get into the details of these parameters uh, during the lecture. What we need to do in order to interpret how accurate this is, is we now need to apply this model to unknown variables, as we are doing today in the lab. Um, so we have built a model, and we're going to use that model to look at how the experiment went throughout the course of the experiment, look at how the concentration changed. Here, uh, what you're seeing is the result of doing this uh, with partial least squares in the lab. We'll look at the result of doing it with uh, principal component analysis. And those are by far the two most important um, uh, regression techniques currently used. We'll discuss other regression te techniques in the, during the lecture. Here we can see that we did quite okay that uh, against our validation data set, where we repeated the experiment and uh, used the model to make predictions in real time or near to real time throughout the course of the experiment. And we compared then after it was finished, we compared the predicted values to the known values. And we ended up with an error of prediction of 0.32. Is the root mean squared error of cross-validation like the sum of errors on the resi residuals? It is, in fact, almost exactly that, except it's the root mean squared error of the sum of the errors uh, on the residuals. Um, so, so, sorry, but yes, some, it's, the, it's the root mean squared error. So um, that tells you how far away from the trend line each of those data points is. So rather than using the trend line, we can deduct the known values from the, predict, the predicted values from the known values. So that gives us our residuals, as David mentions. Right. So uh, what's left over when we deduct the predicted value from the known value? And uh, we can calculate the error on those residuals, which should be zero. Right. If it was perfect, if it was a perfect pr prediction, it would match exactly the known values. Um, but uh, where there is an error, that means our model deviated from the ideal. And we can evaluate the, uh, those errors with respect to one another, the degree of those errors, by looking at the distance between the zero line and those. That's why we take the root mean square uh, of those errors. OK, so rather than the sum, it's the root mean square. Um, and again, how this works, we'll discuss in more detail. Uh, but before we move on, I want to <laughs> pose another question with a, a lovely quote there from George E.P. Box. All models are wrong, but some are useful. What are some examples of useful and wrong models in everyday life? Uh, so again, feel free. I want you to spam the chat box. I'm going to give you some prompts so you can think about this and, and spam the chat box examples of useful and wrong models in everyday life at work in the home <laughs> okay wow okay you, I, i'm uh, i'm pleasantly surprised i lived in france so all revenue linear models are useful but usually wrong is there another oh, yeah. I, ah, I lived in finance. I, I read it as I lived in France. Equally true. <laughs> Incorrect KPIs being used to model the production line. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Um, Fitting formats and templates, assuming they are a clear represent representation of performance or quality. Yeah, I can see the real need for uh, digital transformations uh, across across multiple industries, judging from this chat box. Recipes designed for gas oven, as you have an electric, perfect 
process flow charts, exactly right. Okay, excellent. I'm very happy with those answers. Okay. So, control over my presentation. Oh, yes, on the island of Ireland or in medicines. Stitched out there for a moment. Okay, I want to move back to the lab now to look um, if we're if we're ready, in fact, uh, to look at how chemometrics was actually it, it applied in the real world and to discuss uh, prediction of yield, how we're going to predict the yield. Oh, yes, thank you. All right, so uh, if I may, thank you. So, yeah, what I want us to look at is here, well, before we, before we look at the actual, the chemometrics uh, next, well, what I want you to see here is how, uh, for much of the, this FDIR spectrum, much of the FDIR spectrum, nothing significant changed. There were some fluctuations. Uh, unfortunately, we've lost the overlay. But what you could see there, perhaps, was, and what you'll see building up here again, that for much of the experiment, uh, or for much of the experiment, the there was no real change, only slight fluctuations um, across a lot of the, the, the wavelengths. But at certain peaks, you can see there is there are, there is distinct uh, activity, and these are the peaks that we would select on. And from these peaks, we would form our from from these peaks, we would form our um, chemometric model. We would apl apply principal component analysis, and it would tell us that these are the peaks of interest, and it it would as I mentioned, show where the greatest variance was, and and our principal principal component number one would probably track with temperature. So our principal component two could be used for um, to apply the chemometric model to. Uh, while I'm while I'm asking waiting for, for Kieran to to uh, bring that up for us, um, we might discuss what's going to happen next so that we can use this data. So we can use this data to to make a prediction on based on today's based on uh, on today's experiment. So what we can see now is that the solution has become fully cloud fully clouded. And what we're going to do, uh, what Kieran is going to do in a in a few minutes, is to drain out to drain out the the solution and all of the crystals present, uh, transfer this into a filtration apparatus. And uh, so, pouring the solution, pouring the solution into a fil in, into a filtration funnel with filter with filtration paper in it. Uh, it's going to be drawn into the so the solution is going to be drawn into the ves vessel below using a vacuum pump. And <laughs> perhaps you can see it more clearly now. Um, okay, yeah, I can see it on the on the live stream. Okay, so yes. The solution at, with the crystals in it are going to be poured into the into the um, into the filtration funnel with filtration paper inside. The the solvent is going to be drawn down into the into the bottle, with trapping the crystals in, in the filter paper. Yes, and the yeah the vacuum pump is off to one side. Um, and as long as we don't fill the allow so much solution uh, in that it gets up here, we'll keep our vacuum pump running. Okay. So what we'll then do is remove the filtration paper with our crystals trapped on site, uh, um, trapped on the paper, and measure the weight of that. Measure, in fact, the mass, uh, because we'll have we've weighed the paper in advance. We're going to weigh it afterwards, and we're going to and we're going to um, then deduct one from the other to determine what uh, what mass of crystals we've produced. And we're going to compare that mass to the mass that's still in suspension, because having tracked the concentration throughout the experiment uh, using the FDIR probe, we're, we're going to see how much of the solvent is actually still present. It's uh, applying one of uh, these PCA, principal component analysis models. Um, it'll, it'll tell us how much, how much it expects after the, after the temperature was dropped down from 40 degrees to, to five degrees. So, um, yeah, once that's once that's prepared, we'll take you through the comparison between 
the the mass that's that that we have actually extracted the, the the true yield from the experiment to the theoretical yield from the uh, calculated from the cumulometric model. I'm going to switch back to the slides for the time being while we're waiting for while we're waiting for uh, Kiran uh, to prepare that the results of the model for us. Um, and I'll need to start sharing my screen again. Okay. So. Some audiovisual problems. All right. Okay. Um, so, what we what we've just discussed, uh, the methods that we've talked about, we've we've have sensor attached to our process. I just I, I showed you a level zero earlier uh, in that pyramid. Um, we've gone from level zero. The, the sensing of the actual process to the control of those sensors and ac data acquisition uh, all the way up to level two. This is something that you'll need to do as part of your, uh, as a digital transformation agent. You'll, you'll need to understand the, the methods that are being employed uh, to convert the process data through sensors into meaningful, uh, so the process signals um, into meaningful process data. But what do we do when we get there? So it tells us the concentration. So it, t it monitors over time. Well, we can use this, uh, we can use this process an analysis to, to ultimately control batches. We can use it for discrete control in the case of a programmable, programmable logic controller at the lowest level. We can use it for continuous control where we have a continuous production process. But uh, more valuable insights can be gained then once we have um, our, our control strategy implemented. Uh, more insights can be gained at a, at a higher level. When we start comparing uh, process runs to historic runs, so that we can see not just how it is now, but how it compares to, what, to ideal uh, trends and so on. Okay. Um, oh, hang on. Sorry, I believe I missed a question here. Uh, this is flow charts. Ah, I see. So alcohol is used for for cleaning. So the the transfer bottles will be used, will be washed with the same solvent. Yes. So um, in, in this case, the alcohol is is the solvent uh, of the reaction. Very frequently, uh, IPA is is used just for cleaning um, because it's a it's a decent solvent, but it, in the case of electronics, because it's not uh, conductive. Um, so alcohol, in this case, is used for cleaning, not as the active pharmaceutical ingredient. The active pharmaceutical in, in, ingredient, in this case, uh, is the paracetam. Yeah, very good, very good. Uh, um, in fact, um, I'm delighted uh, our head of engineering um, intervened because I was all on for eliminating entirely some of the the manual steps involved in this process, not showing them uh, at all. But we will. Uh, um, um, we'll have I'll have Chris show you as as Kiran is actually uh, extracting the solvent and uh, transferring it for filtration and so on. Um, yeah. So we'll. We will actually show you these things because, as Chris rightly pointed out, um, some or many of you may not have been in, in a lab, uh, analytical or otherwise, um, ever. So, yes, uh, I mean, there is more of a justification than just that. Uh, I think it is very valuable to see uh, just how time consuming and how uh, resource intensive uh, these, these processes are. And if only to motivate you. To, to, to start using um, fully automated uh, inline and uh, real time or near in, uh, near real time uh, process analytical techniques. Um, okay, so um, I, now we're at a bit of a we're at a bit of a crossroads here because Kieran has now pr prepared the data for us to look at. Um, but so what, what we'll do is we'll look at that data first. And then we'll start. We'll, we'll have a. We'll let Kieran 
start uh, emptying the reactor vessel and, and, and uh, yeah, finding out what our yield was. So we'll make the prediction first and then take a look at the yield. I'm going to switch from the presentation now. Okay. So, so what we're looking at here, yeah, so is what we're looking at here, if you can see my screen, I have two windows uh, open here on top of the others. What we're looking at here is a chemometric software, is a piece of chemometrics software. This is solo. There are many others available on, our, on the market. Uh, one that's very commonly used in industry, one that's very common, commonly used in industry is um, Camo on Scrambler. Might be familiar to some of you. Uh, we have developed our own in-house chemometrics uh, software specifically for near-infrared spectroscopy. Um, but these tools are more general and, uh, and they're statistical analysis packages that can be used to interpret any two data sets. Well, in fact, far more than just two. But you can build a model from two from any uh, two data sets by comparing comparing one to the other. So uh, on the left here is the results of the of the um, the principal component analysis. What we're looking at here is the residuals that was meant that were mentioned. Um, and what we can see in uh, uh, on the left when when uh, on, oh actually it'll be probably difficult for you to see the the details of the graphs. Let's uh, unfortunately, that doesn't really zoom in on the graphs themselves, but it suffice it to say that these are statistical measures of how well the um, the component of interest tracks with uh, with concentration. What we can see is that at the start of the experiment, it measured approximately 35, in fact, we'll call it 34% concentration, and we can see that it dropped down to about two or three percent um, by the end of the experiment. So if if that's if that's correct, then what we should what we should see is uh, a change in the total concentration of 32 percent of the API. And another way to express to, to, to say to state that in a different way um, to state that in a different way uh, what we're what we're seeing is the result of crystals forming from suspension and all we're seeing here is what's left after the majority of those crystals have formed and fallen out of the suspension. So the FDIR tracks only what is what still remains. Okay, so fell from about 34% down to about two or three percent. Yeah, so that's the prediction based on based on the principal component analysis. What I'd like to do now is to show you as as Kieran is is emptying the as Kieran is emptying the reaction vessel, uh, transferring the the fluid, the solvent. It's great uh, to to be filtered, so that it can then be weighed, and we can uh, we can give you the the theoretical compared to the uh, actual yield. So yeah, you can see that Kieran is. You can see that Kieran is uh, emptying the, react the reactor vessel. You can see the volume in the reactor vessel fall as he's filling the um, as he's filling his flask. And yeah. so at this at this stage, the re the reaction is at a steady five degrees. <coughs> So it's been cooled past room temperature uh, throughout the course of the throughout the duration of the experiment. We can see maybe that there are still some. Yes, what we can see is that there are some crystals remaining at the bottom of at the bottom of the reaction vessel. Um, what you'll be able to see, uh, we'll point that out in a moment. Where you can see now the process of uh, filtration. You can see that a lot of the crystals are actually precipitating out of the, sus the suspension because they can no longer stay dissolved. They, they're they no longer stable. They fall out, so they precipitate out. And so in order to get them out of the bottle, Kieran is going to have to swirl the bottle to transfer 
them as they're still suspended into the filtration paper. And you can also see there in the background that the reaction vessel itself has a, a, a coating of crystals too. Um, when we get a glimpse of the background there, yeah. Well, we can we can show you that again when when Kieran is finished. Excellent, thanks, Chris. So, I mean, there's no way to mistake the fact that this is. Uh, there's no way to mistake the fact that this. Um, that this process is laborious and time intensive. Oh, um, questions. Or, as in the uh, coefficient of correlation, the, the correlation coefficient? Uh, Oh yes, can or be used? I see. Sorry, I forgot the context. Yes, absolutely. And in fact, our uh, our in-house chemometric chemo model development um, package uh, uses R. It's an open source. Um, it's an open source. Uh, it's open source software that uses the R statistical pa package uh, for that. It's a very efficient uh, way of of finding your correlations. Okay, so you saw. Uh, you saw the solution being transferred. We could uh, we could take more time, wash out the reaction vessel to transfer more of those crystals from the base of the re re reactor. Um, but we want to use this as, a, as an approximation, as an approximate method. So we will give you a, a quick and dirty uh, yield measure of the yield. Yeah, you can see. So thank you, Chris. You can see some of the crystals are still present at the bottom of the reaction vessel, but. Uh, the point will be the same. So uh, you were asking about the grade of the filter paper. It is a, it is a, uh, it does have a certain certain grade. It has a sp specific mesh or filter size. Yes. Uh, uh, off the top of my head, I'm not sure what what it is. Oh, good. So the filter papers uh, are identified. In fact, uh, different filter papers are in fact identified by the 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 effective pore size, um, yes. So in this case, the, these Wattman filters have, oh, they're just identified by the number um, rather than the pore size. But, but, oh, excellent. Thank you. All right. So this, this is what we're aiming for. The, these are the dried crystals from the previous experiment, one in which uh, the previous experiment is one in which the model was built. And we can see that we have a very nice, um, we have a very nice uh, uh, distribution of crystals here. It's very uniform powder. Um, although I'm just saying this with, with the naked eye, we, we also saw that's true uh, using microscopy earlier. So um, we might even prepare a, a slide to look at from today's experiment so that we can look at that under the microscope too, uh, to compare the results. Oh, the, yes, great, yeah, thank you. All right, so while Kieran is uh, going through the process, process of weighing, I'm going to take you through uh, what we've discussed today, the methods that we've applied today, um, get us from the sensor and signal level to the level of um, monitoring for control. But what I want to talk about next is the steps toward control. And in fact, not just control, but as I mentioned, uh, supervision um, so that we can, where we're using the, the monitoring and control of the current experiment by comparing it to previous experiments, an ideal, ideal uh, reaction or, or, or process development. So uh, I want to switch back now to the, to the presentation again. Um, so if I share my slides one more time. Yep. We have in our own 
Smartex system, which is essentially move, which essentially takes people from the level of sensors, PAT, programmable logic controllers, and supervisory um, <clears throat> uh, supervisory uh, systems like a DCS or a SCADA. Um, um, and attached peripherals, that means actuators and, and other process, um, process equipment that, that's used for control. Um, the control methods at the next level and visualizations so that we can compare, so that we can compare the current run to previous runs and to ideal batches. Um, yes. With that level of PAT, does that imply maintenance of long-term baselines for control purposes? Exactly. In fact, that's exactly the, where I was going next. The next level up is about manufacturing operations management. So, yes, dispatching, dispatching production, detailed production scheduling, with reliable, reliability insurance, uh, assurance, um, generation of workflows, uh, and so on. So that we not just we have not just baselines, but we have trends and allowable upper and lower limits uh, based on analysis in an analytical lab a lot like this with even with other analytical techniques where we just look at the quality of our end product uh, and form um, yes we we form a picture of what a perfect process looks like by judging the quality of those end products using a full suite of analytical techniques this means that we can develop, uh, at this level, we can develop workflows that tie in not just with um, the quality of the end products, but that tie in with um, availability, with inventory, uh, with stock management, and, and so on. So that brings us all the way up to enterprise level. Um, okay. So why bother? Uh, in fact, uh, one, uh, one moment, I'll just respond to a technical difficulty. All right, no, uh, uh, thanks for the online support. No, the, the technical issue was relating to lunch. Um, so, <laughs> so apparently uh, the people in the lab need to eat and presumably that's the case of people at home. Um, but um, yeah, I want to propose the question um, here. Uh, yeah, well, I want to pose the question, first of all, uh, to see how people are uh, how, how people are dealing with with all of what they've received so far? Do they have any questions about uh, the content covered? Um, because what we might do is uh, just finish up uh, this part of the presentation to, before we go for lunch, um, so uh, so that we can ask Kieran then to um, make his measurements and give us the report on how well our prediction has performed. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Warshak, I didn't mean to 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 make you panic. Chocolate whiskey time. Okay, great. Spending my porridge. Excellent. Okay. Um, Well, and don't forget that the topics that are covered here today are covered in a uh, in a series of lectures uh, later on in the uh, later on in, in in the course, and uh, it's not intended for us. You know, we're not 
um, the, the, the outcome here is not that you will be chemometricians. We don't, we don't want that, that's not what we're expecting. What we want from this is that you'll be familiar with the techniques that are used to look at, to see into the process uh, in real time and to take the signals from the process uh, to um, convert that into something usable. Okay, great. Okay. Okay, great. Yeah, so uh, high level high level takeaways here. Uh, I think I'm still sharing the presentation. Yes, I see. Uh, high level takeaways here are that we can see inside a process. You've seen how it can be done. Uh, we can we've seen that. We can convert that data, <laughs> that sensor data signal into something useful, and then we can progress from there to monitor the performance of the, the reaction with respect to others. So we can monitor the, our, how, how well our, our process is performing against how it should. Um, and then we can apply all sorts of interesting data analytics te techniques, um, yes, for uh, process insights, customized wor workflows, decision making and so on. Okay, so we might break there for lunch. Uh, if you uh, have any questions in the meantime, um, I understand that you get an, an hour and a half, but uh, uh, I feel like judging what we have to cover, what we might do is keep it to one hour and um, then come back after, after one hour. And uh, I see the time is now, yeah, a quarter to one. So if we come back at a quarter to two, we'll do one final hour to wrap up. Uh, and uh, yeah, so we'll break for lunch. I'll leave this slide up, I think, and <laughs> as it summarizes a lot. And yeah, great. Um, guten appetit, or buon appetito. Thanks, everyone. Hi, everyone, welcome back. I uh, hope everyone has enjoyed their lunch and is ready to go on. Um, all right. So, yeah. Oh, sorry about the delay and getting back to you. Okay, very good. I see that lots, everyone is back in attendance. That's great. All right. So we will discuss, uh, you know, the higher level processing. Um, but before we do, I want to take you back a step to uh, where we were, where we were earlier. Because what I want to do is to show you uh, this, the, to show you our, our, our system how after the model was applied, what I showed you earlier with the principal component analysis was the simple uh, analysis on a peak area. But this, when it's applied to the entire spectrum, we get a slightly different picture. So there's something of interest to look at here. And we've arranged some of the statistics that we discussed that we we can see. Uh, in the model, we've arranged for the, some of these to be visible on the screen as well. So, um, just to show you, uh, initially, this is what happens when the when the model is applied to the full spectrum. What we see is the progression, the change in concentration from approximately 31 grams per liter. I, I misquoted it earlier as a percentage. In fact, grams per liter of paracetam in um, in alcohol. What we saw is that the prediction um, of concentration drops from 31% all the way down to approximately 5%. Uh, with a, a spike probably due to our interference, the fact that we were, uh, I think I was pointing out the sensor at this moment, uh, which caused uh, uh, the, the sensor to shake. So um, yes, it, it uh, caused a spike in the prediction. So one of the, uh, other things that I wanted to show you here was, in fact, the contributions from the different principal components. So what the principal components look like are different combinations. They're linear combinations of um, the different peaks and the different intensities. But uh, they explain, the different components explain different, different amounts of the variance in the data set. So the first component um, explains 85% of the, the variance in the data. Second component, a further 5%. Third component, a, a further 5%. So 
after um, so the combination of just the th first three components uh, results in 95% of the, the variance in the data being explained by the model. Well, I guess one of the one of the bits that it left out, um, one of the bits that it left out, sorry, was um, its sensitivity to vibration. Okay, so but that's our final that's our final prediction. Um, uh, we expect final mass to remain in suspension of approximately five percent. So I want to go back now to the slides. Or in fact, sorry, uh, um, Kieran has already worked out. Uh, he's already done the measurement of the mass and so on. So um, we obtained our yield was in fact 23.5 grams of the filtered crystals, which we showed you earlier, uh, having started at 31.4 grams. So we could see that the that the concentration prediction agreed extremely well um, there. The final temperature being five degrees and solubility at five degrees being 5.7 grams. Our final, our final uh, concentration was approximately five, uh, five grams. So yeah, and, and the, the calculated yield. So when we compare, uh, when we compare this 23.5 grams to what we expect to remain in the solution is in fact 25.6 grams. That means our yield was approximately 91% with, other losses being accounted for by what's what remains in the reaction vessel as we saw. So very close indeed. But you saw exactly how laborious and arduous and time consuming that process was. So I hope we've justified the requirement and the the use case for process analytical technology where you can you can measure these things in real time in the process or near to real time uh, in line in the process. So what do we do from there? I'm going to start sharing my, my screen again. And um, yeah, we, we can take this process information, the concentration measurements, and we can compare it to where this process should be at a given point in time. But we do this via um, different levels of um, data analysis. So there's a data integration engine for example, that allows us to carry out advanced dynamic process control, but also allows us to connect uh, the, the sensors from the sensor level all the way through to, to uh, cloud and edge deployment. So mobile apps, um, uh, including mobile apps that are um, where uh, where speed connect the speed of connectivity is very important. That's the, that's edge deployment. Uh, cloud deployment so that people can interact with our devices from anywhere in the world. But also this allows us to have the higher levels of data processing required for um, higher level data analytics, applying machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, this And more simpler functions, just like data visual, visualization. The point being that we can use these, uh, this, data visualization and interpretation and even automated interpretation so that we have remote access, we can contextualize our, our data, data sets and analyze them um, automatically and in ways that are not human readable. Okay, so those are, those are the ways in which we have to interact with the data and the advantages of, the data, of, of doing these things. All right. So, yeah, you, t today we've discussed how these sensor data, uh, how the, these sensors, sensors can be attached to a crystallization process and how the, the process parameters can be controlled via that process. We'll also discuss, you'll see this in other lectures and in other demonstrations, how it's applied to fluidized bed technology, for example, and you'll also uh, have the opportunity to discuss this application with twin screw, uh, twin screw uh, technology. You've in fact already, um, you've already identified amongst yourselves in the chat box, the, the benefits of, of, of doing things uh, in this way, in, the, in a fully integrated and connected way, sharing data and knowledge, collaborative research, cross-site process development and control. 
Um, but yes, the real-time data visualization is really important for that automation pyramid so that, so that we can have enterprise-wide um, uh, oversight on our processes and on multiple processes at the same time, for example. So we get all of the bells and whistles, not quite for free, but with a little bit of work. All right. So this, these are things that you'll have to, um, you'll have to be fully aware of as digital transformation agents. You'll have to understand the different parts of the platform that that are that will be needed to um, to connect from the sensor level up to the ERP level. And there are platforms available. The SmartX is one such platform that focuses on that focuses on unit operations like twin screw or crystallization or fluid bed, develops the sensors and in Internet of Things technology in a modular way to integrate the sensors with the, the process equipment so that we can then uh, yeah, use um, data analytic, analytic techni techniques uh, through to uh, through to to third th through to 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 get to achieve our third party device inter integration with our cloud management and, and analytics system obviously part of that platform means um, sec uh, data security so uh, this is whether you use the smartx platform or any um, cyber security is one of the pillars one of the nine pillars of um, industry 4.0 as it will be of industry 5.0 but um, yes, the, the, this integrated approach it, is what allows us to, to have automated design of experiments and, and workflows. Um, but um, yes, so, so that means that we have to be entirely uh, platform agnostic. So whether, the, whether your device is from Thermo Fisher or from Wasatch Photonics or uh, whether your uh, your higher level um, data um, processing is done via uh, Apache or uh, Amazon or Microsoft Azure, our, um, our architecture is in, is entirely independent. Um, oh, so there's a, there's a question here: Is there a pre preference for on-premise over in premises over in cloud? Well, yes. In different industries, there are different preferences. Um, so one of the um, one of the ways in one of the arguments against moving to the cloud is in fact the lag time. So if your process is very very time sensitive, um, it's it it can be dangerous to uh, only allow accessibility and control of that process uh, via the cloud. Uh, any drop in network connectivity um, might impede your process public internet being unreliable for example yes so uh, a compromise is in fact uh, in edge deployment so edge deployment is uh, essentially connected devices that that are um, locally implemented so the, the idea being that is that higher level processing is and can be done on in the cloud um, but that the immediate control is managed uh, on site and locally. So it's a combination of the two because it is a concern. Um, so, I mean, is there are there further pre preferences for on site for on site versus via the cloud? Yes, certain industries are more reluctant on the basis that um, they view any connection to the cloud as being um, a greater risk. Um, if you're aware of the recent uh, attacks on power stations and so on, all the cyber attacks that were brought about by um, by directly um, attacking vulnerable parts of networks, which have uh, lower, um, much much smaller, much lower complexity um, than are you know the, the things that we typically associate with being attached uh, attacked by hackers. Um, so. When everything on your site can be uh, connected to via the internet, that means that everything needs to be supervised and monitored for cybersecurity. 
so yes, there are industries that are particularly sensitive to uh, on-premises on um, versus cloud uh, interactivity. Um, wait, did I miss another one? Okay, yes. All right, so in our case, we've developed this modular architecture that can interface via all of these uh, systems um, to make it as robust and uh, modular as possible. Oh, yes. Okay. So we've discussed um, various control strategies, or I've mentioned various control strategies, recipe-driven control like this process. Other, other uh, control strategies include endpoint control, uh, feedback control, and dynamic process control. And there's also advanced dynamic process control, which we'll discuss next. But before, before we do, um, I'd like to, you to think of some examples, and again, I want you to spam the chat box. Uh, there are plenty of examples of all of these in the kitchen and around your house. Um, so uh, can you think of recipe-driven control strategies, endpoint control strategies, feedback control strategies, and dynamic process control strategies? Without um, the, the, the language is, is, I'm sure, uh, familiar. There's not, there's not too much jargon in there. Uh, central heating, perfect, yes. Uh, heating, heating water, absolutely. Central heating is an example of, of which type? Thinking up my white sauce. <laughs> okay, wow, we've already gotten to the dynamic process control. Sorry, I'm giving the game away. Dishwasher recipe, perfect, yes. Uh, did I, uh, who's this? Laundry? Oh my gosh, there's, this is actually happening too fast to keep up with. <laughs> I need a bot to do this for me. Um, Oh, I see, no, the chat box has just jumped around. Uh, heating the water, thinking of white sauce, dishwasher recipe, recipe and feedback, yes. Uh, washing machine, uh, using the oven as feedback, yes, absolutely. Air fryer, microwave use. <coughs> so, yes, um, my favorite example, most of these uh, are cooking eggs, right? So recipe driven control, you know exactly what you're supposed to do in order to get a soft boiled egg. Uh, you put it in the water for three minutes and you take it out, or four minutes, or whatever. <laughs> That's recipe-driven control. But in fact, uh, most people, when they're making an omelet, they use dynamic process control. So they realize that they're supposed to stir the eggs together, and whisk, whisk the eggs together very quickly beforehand. Uh, they put them into the pan and allow the egg to roll around and form an even surface, and then fold and do all of that but in fact what most people realize is halfway through that they've made a mess of it so they're going to use dynamic process control to change it into scrambled eggs uh, <laughs> it's just genuinely an example of dynamic process control with endpoint control being this you know deciding fine I'll, I'll have them now they're dry enough that's um scrambled eggs feedback control is adjusting if you're a chef adjusting the the temperature at the right time so that it doesn't happen. <laughs> all right. Um, so, but yes, all of these strategies we're familiar with and they, they're implemented all around us. Um, but one that might be not quite so familiar is advanced dynamic process control and controller development, right? So this kind of development requires a deep understanding of the process itself. So we need to identify what our crit critical process parameters are identify what the critical quality attributes are and the quality target product profile. So what are we happy with? What, would, what should the end product look like and how should it behave? Uh, that's what determines our, our critical quality attributes and ultimately that's what helps us identify our critical process parameters. So we can, we can manipulate the process parameters to explore the process design space. And we do this uh, using ranging experimentation. So we start with a known good recipe, for example, and we identify reasonable upper and lower limits for a given process parameter. So if we know that, um, if we know that a good starting point for the dissolution of paracetam is 50 degrees, uh, we, might, we might start the experiment at 50 degrees, but in order to explore the space around that, we might 
uh, have another uh, attempt at the experiment at where we start at 40 degrees and another attempt at 60 degrees and compare the, the results of the end product, end product. Or if we've already developed if we've already developed our chemometric models, we can monitor the process in line to see how it's evolving. And ultimately, we can use these kinds of ranging experiments to come up with, uh, with dynamic process controls that can judge for themselves uh, whether, the, uh, whether the product is currently moving in or out of spec. Okay, so the procedure that you then follow is, is mapped then to the right. So you start, you can start with a model, you implement it, execute it, monitor and op optimize uh, in, in, uh, with real-time optimization um, or as near as, as near as you can make it. Okay, to get there, of course, control logic has to be defined for each phase throughout the process. In our case, um, with the crystallization, this is, this is the simplest, this is one of the simplest demonstrations of how this might be implemented. Um, we have the initial phase where the temperature is, is set, there's a set temperature of 40 degrees where it's maintained. In fact, the first phase is um, a dissolution. The second phase, <clears throat> the second phase is a holding temperature. And the third phase is when nucleation is uh, started by lowering the te temperature at a specific rate. So in this case, we've already identified uh, we've already identified a recipe control, but to elevate that to a control logic that should be defined for each process phase, we could use the signal from our concentration measurements to judge uh, how far out of spec um, the how far out of spec the, the um, control is going. By which I mean, when we are exploring the phase space. Uh, if we see that our concentration, so we've started at a much lower temperature. If, we're, we, if we see that our concentration isn't decreasing rapidly enough, it suggests that nucleation is happening too slowly. Uh, so we might end up with particles, crystals that are too small for our purposes. But yes, so at each phase, we need to decide on a control, control logic. So let's get from recipe to advanced dynamic process control. So yeah, we est establish the key dynamic control relationships, fixed set points, phase and process endpoint criteria by judging the quality of our product. This can really only be done using real-time processes and PAT data. We need the constant feedback in order, in order to determine where it is relative to where it should be. So we need flexible, uh, flexible control logic to be implemented and executed via process and scripting and to get a, a lot of motorized equipment certainly um, or certainly uh, at least uh, connected equipment yes great um, so yeah um, our head of engineering Chris um, has just pointed out that uh, uh, he'll cover a lot of this in de in depth at the next uh, at the next demonstration in the process lab um, in our oral solid dose manufacturing process lab as well. So there are specific implementations with other PAT, so with our particle sizer and with our near infrared instrument, and he'll discover he'll he'll discuss how we've implemented that for SmartX. Um, okay. So. In the case of crystallization, though, this is how it can be applied for accelerated crystallization process design. We get our real-time process information, which gives us ultimately feedback control. So we can adjust process parameters on the fly or have them once we've set up the parameters, we can have them adjust automatically, which allows us to explore the phase space uh, the different permutations of process parameters um, much faster, so this allows us allows for faster development. We don't need to wait until the end of the process to determine uh, how it's performing, for example. So this is obviously quicker to implement as well. But here then, it's open standards, so it's easily integrated with and easy to integrate with. So as I mentioned, it's device agnostic. So the idea is that um, that this can be implemented 
depending on how the user already works. So it's user needs focused. Um, and, and you'll see that this is the approach to take for all digital transformation solutions. Right? So um, yeah, this is an example of how it, how it needs to be done. Uh, because from one site to another, you might have difference from even within a site, you might have different differences in the technology, the PAT or the process equipment that's used. You might have older stuff that needs to be retrofit. You, know, you might have newer stuff that already has a higher level, perhaps even the level of supervision. Uh, so um, these kinds of implementations need to have need to be device agnostic and user needs focused. Um, device agnostic. Oh, yes. uh, when you say device agnostic, I assume you, uh, I assume standard data connection methods between devices. Yeah, MQTT. Yeah, yeah. Or queuing and standard data layouts and messages. Yes. Uh, MQ or OPC, or, there are various open communication protocols um, that, are, that are used. And yes, standard, standardized data layouts and everything. And in fact, um, when we talk about the journey from, uh, from sort of pre-digital infancy to uh, sort of advanced manufacturing, level five maturity, um, it, it, it's, so it is a journey of um, different layers of abstraction, different um, you know, further layers of standardization and um, defined processes. Uh, so yes, the, so ex exactly the description of um, going from the sensor level up to the ERP level, um, that is the same, it, it is the same journey. It is, uh, it is a series of steps of standardization uh, and but also of open standards. Um, yes, so th then yes, this this system works because it's a, it's ready to go, secure, it's a secure cloud and edge solution. Uh, so there, there is standardized and automated data collection and data analysis. Have we got one there? Oh yeah, no, that's the same one. Okay. All right. So yes, what we looked at today was uh, real-time integrated end-to-end -end solution. This is the application of, of the application of this technology uh, at a higher level then is real-time integrated end-to-end -end solution for crystallization, process monitoring, and control. So it's a modular system that incorporates the different tools that we discussed today from different vendors using different communication protocols, um, MQTT on the on um, on the part of the RAM and spectrometer uh, and OPC on the part of the FTIR system. It's a modular system that incorporates advanced tools for process development and automation. So the SmartX system connects directly to our chiller to, for the control or even the stirrer. Um, and in fact, allows a user to define recipes um, uh, of, via the cloud uh, as well as um, as well as on site. So, and delivers, as uh, if I recall, Stephen um, asked earlier, it delivers time aligned visualizations of the process machine and the sensor data, and even the interpreted data too. So, it supports automating analysis workflows and ensuring data integrity throughout. Okay, so um, yeah, I, I'll switch back then from the from back into the lab. Oh yeah, of course. At this rate, I might not make it to the to those lectures that I mentioned. Um, <laughs> yeah. So we've we've already discussed, in fact, the final yield. But what I wanted to show you was was the results of our crystals. Um, if I could have the, have those crystals there uh, from the from today's experiment. Yeah. Um, I think they're on, still on the mass balance over there. Yeah, please. Uh, I wanted to show you the, the results of our experiments, our process run today. Um, yeah, so we have very fine grains, just as the, in the previous previous sample that I showed you. Oh, here we are. So hold it up. Um, just as in the previous sample that I showed you, very fine powder uh, that is has very good flowability. So why is it? Oh, here I better help you out now. There we go. And uh, we can see the crystals twinkling in the light. 
noise. Um, so yes, uh, obviously one of the reasons we uh, one of the reasons that we want to be able to control the particle size, and this will come up in the, in the next uh, in the next uh, demonstration as well. One of the reasons that we want to control why it's critical um, is so that you have uniform distribution uh, not in, in the in the tablet for delivery, um, but also for absorption uh, in the body. Uh, but even before you get there, uh, it's it's critical to have flowable powders um, when you're processing them, uh, adding your binders and so on. Uh, we need to have good control over particle size. So um, yes, we this is how. Uh, so this this is the next step in the Smart X uh, platform is to include is to include um, uh, an imaging system so that we can we can actually see the the particle the crystals forming in real time. Uh, to a degree, uh, if if you go too small, then they become uh, they compact too easily, which can cause them to clog uh, equipment. It depends it depends entirely on the crystal itself. Certain crystals are extremely flowable, regardless of how how small they are, um, and and they don't compact too easily. Uh, some crystals are extremely problematic in that they <laughs> refuse to compact, regardless of this, their size. Um, but yes, uh, there there is an ideal there is an ideal size range, and it, there will always be a size distri distribution uh, due to the nature of um, the synthesis. In that, um, some of the crystals will grow to a certain size, then break against one another and become smaller. So you'll have a distribution of larger and smaller crystals present. Are there any other questions uh, on the synthesis and the results today? Well, I think I'll, I'll let you think about that. So, does the distribution resemble a uh, standard distribution? Frequently, yes. Sometimes it's a bimodal distribution. If, um, like in um, in today's experiment, we had two different forms. Uh, we had two different forms of the of, of the crystals um, for one part of the ex during one part of the experiment. Because we left the the crystals to grow, the less stable form. Uh, for, after their crystals formed, um, the less stable form, uh, form two, uh, essentially redissolved and um, uh, be, yeah, were transformed into into form three crystals. So, but in, in the initial, if we had looked at the if we had looked at the the particle size distribution, we would have seen two peaks, one for form a, uh, one for, for form two, uh, which were the more rounded particles. And another size distribution for for um, another peak in the size distribution for form three. Uh, but otherwise, yes, uh, it is a random, it's a st stochastic process. So uh, the result would be a normal or standard distribution. Um, in this case, two forms were being synthesized at the same time, so we get a bimodal distribution. Another reason to get a bimodal distribution. Um, and in fact, one of the graphs you pointed out earlier uh, had uh, it had three peaks in its distribution. The reason there being the presence of agglomerates. So yeah, um, uh, and a agglomerate can be when two crystals come together. It could be when three crystals come to come together. And with a high enough resolution in your in your particle size distribution analysis, you can see those individual individual particles compared to um, uh, multiples of those. Particles. So, with uh, two particles together and, and agglomerates where there are three particles, etc. Okay. Um, so, if there are no other questions, uh, then uh, I might wrap up. So, you've seen how we've taken the sensor, the sensor data. We we looked into our we looked into our reaction, and we took that sensor data and made sense of it uh, using chemometrics. Uh, part of that journey involved comparing the sensor signal uh, to, uh, so oh, just over time, in the case of principal component analysis, 
and comparing that to how we know our, our concentration is changing. We also discussed how you can compare the signal uh, to a reference method uh, using, for example, partial least squares regression. And so we've talked about how to, to get from the sensors inside the process, seeing inside the process, to useful process information, and how you can then use that process information to, um, to evaluate to evaluate the quality of your product in real time and make adjustments in real time and at a higher level automate that process so that you can have ad advanced uh, dynamic process control. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thanks to, to Kieran and Chris and Warstek as well. Um, <laughs> that, was, um, that was Chris. Um, uh, if you have any other questions in between now and the lecture, which I'll give in, I believe, weeks eight and nine, um, by all means, uh, feel free to send me an email. I'll put my email up on screen. Um, and Or after the lectures, you can ask uh, in Moodle. If you do ask any questions, uh, I won't identify you, but I will summarize the questions that I get and provide those questions and their answers to uh, to to everyone, uh, so that everyone has the benefit of those answers. Yes, yes, the slides will be available in Moodle. Uh, I'll set that up. Uh, and in fact, if you have any questions, feel free to ask me via Moodle as well. Once I am set up, I'll, I'll be circulating. Um, yes, uh, I'll be circulating the links. To the, yeah. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>